Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Meeting to order, Mr. Turner. I, th I think you have the honors. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that you have made. We were reminded that we are commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are all here in Alamance County neighbors, and the fulfillment of that commandment requires that we show one another respect, that we listen, and try to understand one another. That's no more important than here tonight. And we ask that the speakers remember that and that the listeners remember that and that we conduct these proceedings in with a measure of dignity that is pleasing to you. Amen. Will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> do we have speakers? We do not have any speakers signed up currently to speak on any agenda items. Do you see any callers in the queue, Bruce? Not, 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 okay. not yet. All right. No speakers, Mr. Chairman. All right, moving on, I assume there are no uh, commissioner responses to no comments. Mm -hmm. Would someone make a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Any comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. A motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, at this point, Mr. Mac Williams. Good to see you again, sir. Thank you very much, commissioners. May I remove the mask? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. sir. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mac Williams. I'm president of the Alamance Chamber and represent Alamance County's economic developer for the county. It's been my pleasure to do so for the last 17 years. Uh, uh, one of the projects that I'm most proud of in that tenure was the location of Lotus Bakeries to Mebbick. Uh, back in 2016 that represented their initial, uh, uh, their first and only U.S.-based manufacturing facility for the company, which is a global company based in Belgium. Uh, and they're the producer of the well-known brand Biscoff, Biscoff Cookies, and that's uh, what they're making in Mebbin now. Uh, and we're proposing, they are proposing to have a, uh, an expansion, and that's what they're here to talk about tonight. So it's New so jobs, you possible further, new jobs and tax base to the county. I apologize. We need to have a motion to open the public hearing, yes, which is you're getting, you're getting ready to announce. Okay. Well, motion to just, open the public yeah. hearing. Second. Any discussion? There yes. None? All in favor? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Oh, just just a, a moment uh, on that motion. I, I, I need to uh, ask that the board uh, recuse me from, uh, from the vote on this, and I would also like to uh, just not participate in the discussion. I need to announce that that Lotus is uh, a client of my firm, and not only of my firm, but, but I have represented them before I became a county commissioner. And so I think the outcome of this vote would have a direct financial benefit to me, and so I therefore, on, under the statutes, seek that the board recuse me from motion this to, proceeding. Motion to approve his re request for recusal. Second. Any further discussion? I clearly think you have a financial interest. <laughs> Oh, in, uh, in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Now we need to uh, vote on the motion to. Uh, 
I think we already have a motion and, and, a, a, second. and a second. All in favor of opening the uh, public hearing, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, unanimous. Thank you. You're quite <laughs> welcome. I'm just so eager to get started because it's, 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 it's such good news. I'm not going to take up any more time uh, about me or the company. Uh, that's what the speakers are here for. We do have three company representatives here tonight. Uh, Mike M Mikael Bloman, who's the finance and operations director. Bart Vanderwigen, who is the plant director. Uh, and Derek Durbin, the senior project controller. Uh, they're all three here. I think McKeel is going to be the primary speaker, so I'll invite him up to the podium now. There is a PowerPoint that they would like to share about the company and about the project, and that can be uh, a basis for your comments and questions as well as those from the public. So I'll invite McKeel up here to make the presentation. And Mr. Williams, we appreciate your 17 years. Mm -hmm. Definitely. My pleasure. It's an easy place to sell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, just, uh, sure. Oh, well, thank you. Um, all right, thank you for uh, having us here uh, tonight. Uh, um, as already introduced, my name is uh, Michiel Blumen, uh, working for loads of bakeries uh, in the US for uh, responsible for uh, finance and operations. And we have Bart, who uh, presented here a couple of years also for uh, the first uh, expansion in North Carolina, and Derek, who is uh, leading us from a project perspective. We added uh, a presentation to walk you through our story. Eh? I first want to give an introduction to the company. I think many of you know Biscoff, but I want to dive a little bit deeper. I uh, want to give you some, some uh, updates on the existing operations, then what we propose to do, eh? go into the investment and then the value proposition. Now, what is our mission? Our mission is to create small moments of joy and happiness. We cannot guarantee that we can make you happy, but at least give you some moments uh, of happiness. And we do that through uh, uh, yeah, a good range of branded products in the market to every consumer, to at every moment, whether you're on a plane in the air, whether you're on the go, you're on a hotel in a restaurant, or just at home, we want you to be able to get that product. Yeah? in every country. That's our ambition. Now, the six pillars of our strategy is, first of all, quality. You need to have a quality product. That's where it starts with. That's what keeps us in business for 90 years already. Of course, we want to focus on those items that make us successful. We don't have a range of 200 different products. No, we, have, we focus on those that make sense. We also need to communicate well with, with our customer, with our consumer, because we're a branded product. And we want to bring innovation that, that makes sense. And I'll dive into that later on in our proposal. Uh, of course, we want efficiencies, because the more efficient we are, the more we can invest in the brand. And we want to have a sustainable business. On that last element, what do we understand under sustainability? We want to do something back for society and play our role there. It's very important to us. One of the examples is that we started a, a code of conduct that we asked everyone in our company, all employees, to sign off on. Uh, and not only our employees, but also everyone that we work with. Because we want to make sure that that's cookie that you get, eh, that everyone that collaborated towards that is respecting those core values that we believe are very important. Our employees are, of course, key to us. If you look at our factories in, in, in Belgium, there you have people working for us 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, a lot of colleagues that, that start their career with us and retire with us, that's what makes us successful. It's a family business that wants to, to, to have those kind of employees. Our people, yeah, we want people to be able to, to uh, consume our products in a, in a sustainable way. We also then ensure that you get, for example, the right pack uh, on every occasion that you use. You don't need a full pack when you're on the go. That's too much. You're going to waste it. Also, we don't add any conservatives or colors or, or whatsoever to our products. An environment? Yeah, of course we want to play a role there. And so we as company committed to, by 2025, as an example, have fully recyclable packaging. 
That's, of course, a long timeline, you will say, but it goes in steps. For example, all our product on the airlines in 2021 will already be with fully recyclable uh, packaging. That's very important, of course. Now, our executive team, the ones eh, we have to uh, present our projects to and that also allocate our, our budgets. Our CEO is Jan Bonen. He's the third generation uh, of the family for a company that's 19 years old. That's pretty impressive, I think. Uh, Isabel Maas is our CEO for Natural Foods. We started more uh, a natural foods segment pillar in our business, uh, mainly focused on fruits, snacks. It's already uh, a good portion of our business now, and Isabel is leading that one. Mike Cuvelier is our CFO. He yeah, is, of course, an important player in, uh, in our investment decisions. Then we have uh, Ineas Heyman, our COO, uh, responsible for uh, taking the US business under his direct supervision. And then we have William Dupre responsible for everything related to R&D quality procurement. So those are for us key decision makers uh, that we present our projects to. And they are responsible for the whole group, whether it's uh, our home country, Belgium, or other countries uh, like the US. If you look at our presence, so uh, as, as nicely introduced, we're an international uh, group, headquarters in Belgium. Basically, in all the or most of the European countries, we have our own um, people, our own business. In the US, we have our uh, head office and sales office in San Francisco. And then here, of course, our manufacturing plant close by. In Asia, we have then our activities in uh, China and South Korea. And all the other countries that are uh, yeah, uh, not gray, I don't know what color I need to use, salmon probably, uh, we work with distributors, so you can also find Biscoff over there, and those are kind of seeds for the future to then bring on people there later on, and also uh, bring our products to us. Our US team then, oh, my clickers, ah, voila, there we are. Uh, US board members, we have Michelle Singer, she's our overall uh, U.S. general manager responsible for uh, the sales office and, and the manufacturing plant. Myself for finance operations. Margo Joris, who is focusing on natural foods, so our, our new pillar. And then Christian Tesoro, who is our sales director for uh, Biscoff. And uh, a little bit of timeline of how we ended up uh, here. Uh, so we started in 1932 back in Belgium. And um, at some moment in time, there was a distributor, a US distributor, being uh, at Lotus or at Expo, experienced the product and said, oh, this is something that could work out in the US market on, on airlines. Okay, I said, good idea, let's bring it over. Of course, people uh, saw it on board. Where can I get it? Yeah, nowhere. Uh, so that's when we started a catalog business. Uh, and from there, we went into uh, our own sales office in 2009 and then moved on with first retail business at Kroger, Walgreens and in the meantime all the grocery uh, products moved on with launching uh, Spread, this was Spread and then in 2015 important year because we started to uh, bring our product on other airlines and Delta, with American Airlines and in the meantime a lot of others as well we launched the bare fruit rolls here in 2017, and then of course 2019 was a big year for us with the opening of the of the plant right here, and also the launch of this of ice cream at that point in time. So that's a bit how we ended up uh, here. Now, looking at the existing operations, so the initial uh, scope of the project, uh, we started in 2018 with the land. Eh? not too much to see at that moment in time and uh, by August of that year main part of the, yeah, the raw construction was done and closest to here you see the tall building that's where mainly we make the door and and have the raw materials and store the finished product then more in the back you see like a long uh, building where you then get the ovens two big ovens and two packaging lines for our Biscoff product Well, we go to the next one, what, uh, slide build from a different direction where in the front we then see the offices, the tall building, and then the long uh, <coughs> ovens and packaging lines after that. Land of 37 acres, current building 118,000 uh, square feet, and the proposal that 
uh, that we bring to the table is another 103,000 square feet. Now, what do we make there? Oh, voilà, there we go. So on the top left, uh, you see uh, our an important product. It's it's a it's an Excel two cookies basically wrapped together, which you get complimentary on all major airlines right now. Uh, on the on the left bottom, you see an important product that we make for Costco right now in your Costco, if you would uh, be there. Uh, on the top right, you see our, our Hero SQ, like we call it. It's a 250 gram, which you can can experience at home, can experience it everywhere, which you find at all major retailers, but for example, also at your food line, at Walmart, at uh, Harris Teeter, or any other. And uh, online, we have a good presence at Amazon uh, with the, the, the 250 gram, like we call it, our main item, but also those fruit rolls, uh, crumbles, there are a lot of related products. Now, what do we propose? This is the same building, but from another direction now, where you see, uh, at, in the back, you see the tall building that's, that stays. And we propose to add an additional production hall and an, ex an additional hall for our storage of, of our products and our packaging, which in total is 137 feet wide and 755 feet long. That's pretty big. Look at it, um, and we want to add three production lines in there, so three ovens, three packaging lines, and then that that corridor for packaging. You see some other views here from the top, um, yeah, and then I think we'll see a bit where they take away the wall, uh, so you can see how many pallets. Uh, basically, we want to add 750 pallet positions. How many square feet for the addition? 103,000 square Thank feet. Thank you. I heard you say it, but I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then an inside uh, view of that, of that corridor. Now, what do we want to do with that? Um, today, uh, we have two lines, uh, as, I, as I mentioned three additional lines that allows us for two of those lines to make more of the product for uh, our airlines SKUs, but also bring in some of the SKUs that we currently sell in the US, but still import from Europe. We still import a lot of uh, containers from Europe. Yeah? And uh, the question now is where do we bring that extra capacity, of course, do we bring it over here? Do we bring it over in Belgium and continue to send over uh, containers. Now one of, the, one of the three lines that we propose would be for a sandwich line, like we call it. It's something new on the market. It's a round, it's two round Biscoff cookies with a filling in between of Biscoff cream, chocolate or vanilla. Uh, something that we launched uh, in the market last year and that we're now expanding to uh, overall grocery. Right. In terms of investment, we're talking about an investment overall of, of $60 million, which we're going to spread over two and a half years. Why? Of course, we first need to build the building and then take line by line, because obviously each time you need to install it, get it up to and running, have all the people on board, get everyone well trained, uh, and that's why we do that step by step. We want to bring 86 additional jobs. Uh, in packaging, in bakery, technical uh, jobs, and in, in, in warehouse management. Like that. Right. Now, the value proposition is, of course, we've been in business for 90 years, of which three in North Carolina. And uh, I think We've been a stable business that has been able to deliver upon its promises. I think we've been able to deliver upon our promise of the first project, and we're very happy that we have been able to do so. And we, of course, want to do that uh, again. Of course, we, we believe that that will help also in bringing additional business to uh, the region here. And having an additional investment into this region also gives the credibility, of course, and, and exposure towards other businesses to come over here. And linked to that, of course, if we bring 
those additional 86 jobs, then that's also bringing additional spending of uh, those people. And yeah, a lot of work related to constructing the building and then operating the building where we of course need local businesses to, to help us with. Well, that, that was my core short introduction. I don't know if there are specific questions at this point. I'll ask a real simple one because that's the only kind of question I would ask. <laughs> I read in all the information it said like 86 jobs and 60 actual jobs. I'm new. So what does that mean? So 60 actual jobs means for the current uh, two lines. Mm -hmm. The 86 that we want to bring is then for three uh, okay. additional lines of which that sandwich line is a bit more complex in the sense that we need to put cookies on each other and have that filling in between, which, which requires additional uh, people to be able to do so. Okay, and one other thing, um, are these jobs, will they have health insurance with them? Yes. Okay. Good. On, uh, online, I think your entry salary rate's about 13 and some change an hour, is that correct? In the initial one, so we have indeed different levels eh, where uh, once in the beginning we, we train everyone eh, and then they have an entry salary depending on the role that they have, but then quickly they can move up uh, to, to, to a higher level role, which we obviously encourage and, and try to help them to us because it's our most benefit. Uh, it's in our benefit to have, to have that team that is there a long time right. and experienced because if we, we are able to build that, then we're also more efficient in, in, in running our lines, which is obviously a win-win, and then they go to that, to that next level. Uh, I just, this, is, this question just came to mind. Do you have a, an idea of your current employment base? What percentage of those employees are actually from Alamance County? Which ones might come in from outside the county? I would have to, uh, I don't know that. I look at I, I couldn't say that for uh, for sure, but what is very clear is that uh, whether some other uh, companies are doing a hard effort on hiring uh, in the area, so we see that we have to, to try to pull. But we have made the analysis uh, and, and seeing which markets in Alamance County might have been underused in our company. So for example, for our natural foods, we did a push in uh, translating documents and everything because we saw like around Burlington there was an uh, underused Hispanic mm -hmm. population where we have pulled quite a lot of people now. So that was for an example of a strong uh, pool within Alamance County. Okay. The average salary is $43,500. That's, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Nobody else? Okay, we're in our open meeting. Let um, do, we, do we have any questions from the outside? We don't have any callers in the call queue for the public here, and I'm not sure about out in the audience. All right. Has anyone signed up for that they, of the audience? They don't have to sign up. They just All have right. to go up to the podium when you call. Excellent. Three, three minutes? Is it three minutes for a public hearing or do you get longer? Is it three minutes for the public hearing or is it five minutes? I think it's okay, I thought it was, I it was different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay. We're going to open it up to uh, you folks if you have any more comments. If not, we're going to open it up to the audience. So. Okay. If you'll just have a seat right here, please, sir. All right. And we appreciate your presentation. Absolutely. Anyone on this side that has a public comment? Yes, sir. Mr. Moser. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Sam Moser. I uh, grew up in Alamance County, lived here all my life. I love Alamance County. Uh, want to, uh, this, I guess, my first opportunity to say congratulations to Commissioner Turner for being uh, appointed by the Republican Party. 
Congratulations. Uh, Commissioner Paisley, your uh, election. Uh, Commissioner uh, Lastly and Ms. Thompson for being a, one of our new county commissioners. So congratulations thank to you, each of you. you. First thing I'd like to do is just thank each of you and thank uh, Sheriff Johnson for protecting the people in Elmas County and for working with the cleanup of the litter program Amen. across our highways. It's most needed. Thank you for that. Uh, gosh, what do I want to do? I come out of retirement just for this <laughs> special meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Get your shoes on, Sam. I, I like to. Uh, I like to also thank all of our county employees, our leaders in the county. I know you folks have had a stressful time the last year, and I thank all of you done an outstanding job. Thank all of you for what you do in the county. Uh, Lotus Bakery, Michael did a great job with your presentation. Uh, I'm just uh, impressed with the company. What you folks have done through the years, I think it's really outstanding. I uh, want to congratulate Mr. Mike Williams on getting ready for retirement and wish you the most, the best happiness in your retirement days. You're too young to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, We're trying to talk him into unretiring and seeing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, of course, most of you know I have through the years felt opposition to incentives. Uh, sort of kept up with things through the years. Uh, sort of read what Lotus Baker has done through the years, how successful you have been. But I've also read how much money has come from the county and the city of Mebane. And you want everybody to be loving and happy, but I wonder if we could do something about all that incentives money that you keep asking our county commissioners for. Uh, we might have been a little bit happier, but beside the point, uh, I'm just going to read a couple of things right here. In 2016, the incentive request was $3 million from the city of Mebbin and the county. And Mr. Van Winberger, hope that's correct, said at the meeting in 2016 that we want to grow fast and we need to be close to our customers. And he said, in other words, we need to manufacture over here, meaning right here in, I think, Alamance County. So those were comments in 2016. The company stated they believe in commitment, and that's obvious from their success. And one other comment was in the paper was, when we build, it's for 100 years. So I assumed that you meant if you got the $3 million in uh, 2016, you were going to be here for 100 years. <laughs> right, Michael? But now, after the money in, in 2016, two years later, in 2018, more money was asked for from the county, just two years later. So, and here we are again today, asking for, I'm not sure how much it is. I've saw several different figures in the paper, so I'm not sure if it's 600,000 or a million dollars. And there was some comment that, or you may go back to Belgium and do the expansion. But we just certainly hope you don't do that. We hope you think about Valmance County, our government officials, and our location here, that regardless of what happens tonight, you're certainly going to stay here in our county. So that's. That's about all the comments I have to make. Just, uh, just want to ask our commissioners, it just seemed like somewhere we need to stop all these money giving out to these big corporations. It just seemed like somewhere we need to stop it. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Again, Wilson. congratulate you folks on your great company. And thank you. You're Anyone welcome. else on this side of the room? 
Yes, sir, Mr. Vines. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Henry Vines, and I, too, am a lifetime resident of this county. Uh, Mr. Moser has given a pretty good analysis of what's been going on. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, I'm opposed to these incentives. I think that uh, we entered into a contract with Lotus in good faith. And uh, to bring this company here back in 2016. And both the Alamance County and Mevin were willing to give this company uh, an incentive to come here. And they did. And then like Mr. Moser says, two years later, they came back for an additional funding. And now here we are asking for a third funding, which is 600 thousand dollars from the county six hundred thousand uh, dollars from Mebbin with a hundred thousand dollars additional waivers of fees and uh, inspections so commissioners uh, I appreciate y'all coming and, and being part of our community and I think y'all find that this is a good place to do business and as the comments were made earlier, uh, this is where Lotus has determined this is where their business is. This is where their customers are. So why would you not want to be close to your customers? Why would you want to ship all the way across the ocean products that you can produce here and make more profit? It only makes common sense. Uh, secondly, uh, in the contract, and I read through the contract, uh, there are so many ways of outs for this company. If they don't do the 60 million, then uh, it, it'll be okay to do the 45 million. Of course, they're going to drop down. You know what they're going to get. But if we're going to make a commitment here of 60 million dollars, then the commitment ought to be 60 million. And if we give the incentive and they don't spend the 60 million then it don't get nothing. Uh, that's my opinion. And the 83 employees the same way. If you don't meet the benchmark of 83 employees, or 86 employees, excuse me, 86 employees, then if you don't meet it, then you don't get it. And uh, I don't think there should be loopholes in the contract that says, oh, well, you know, if you don't do this, we'll give you an extension. If we do this, well, I've never done business like that. I either, I either hold to my commitments or I pay the consequences. Either way it goes. Uh, and uh, on the salaries, uh, I went online just like the others have, and the starting salary is $13.67 an hour, which equates to about $23,400. $23, and we're saying we're going to have an average salary of $43,540. Well, that's not quite double, but it's almost double. And I understand entry, entry employees, I understand that, but how long is it going to take for those employees to get to that $43,000 and $500? And also in the contract, it says there's something in there, a stipulation about is they don't have to hold this for a year. So after a year's time, can they lay off people and still receive their incentives. Um, commissioners, I just feel that it's time for y'all to take a stand and just say no. We appreciate your business. I don't think it's right that we should be threatened that if you don't give us this money, uh, we're going to go back to Belgium. Uh, I don't know that Belgium is the best business atmosphere from what I've learned uh, their tax rates are way way higher than ours and uh, that's all commissioners I appreciate you listening to me and my concerns and uh, I just wish that y'all would stop giving <laughs> this money away 
I certainly do want to say too, I understand Mr. Paisley, I understand about, uh, you know, net gain on investment. I know that uh, we'll be giving 120,000 out, we'll be receiving 280 back on taxes. And I, my time's up, but the, I just want to say on the equipment, do we have a depreciation, depreciation scale in the county? So at the end of five years, we're not going to be getting that much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any other comments on this side of the room? Now to this side, any comments? Are there any other comments from no, outside? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And I see Bruce shaking his head no as well. All right. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Motion I'll, to move to close the public hearing. I'll second. All right. Any comment on closing? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. And we still continue your abstention. So thank you. Okay, we're now around for public comment. No, excuse me, commissioner comments. I have some comments. <laughs> All right. First off, um, yeah, the average salary, I understand, um, Mr. Vines, that we will have average salaries that will be below the $43,500 per year initially. But I really and honestly believe we have to have lower salaries at some point to bring in younger employers, employees. Uh, if we don't do that, Young folks aren't going to be able to earn a living anyway. Um, I know what's going on with Congress, United States Congress, and so forth now, but that, but we can't predict that. Um, and you folks uh, with Lotus and we as county commissioners have to deal with whatever's coming. Um, but um, the amount that you mentioned as a starting salary uh, is not a bad starting salary, and the average is the 43.5. It's not the beginning salary or the top salary, either one. Um, secondly, um, if they do not meet their obligations, obviously the amount of money, and it's not $120,000 that Alamance County is giving, it's uh, $60,000 over a period of five years. Now, I've reviewed this contract and, and we all know what's in it. Um, so you're looking at a little, uh, little over 100000 per year for the five years. If they don't meet those obligations as uh, committed in the contract, which if you've gone online, you've seen, and all the county commissioners have reviewed carefully, um, if they don't meet those uh, goals, then guess what? They don't get a lot of the money. It is on a decreasing scale, depending on the uh, compliance with, with that. And we, as a county, look at it, and I've talked to the finance uh, chairman and, and so forth, um, as recently as Friday uh, on those obligations and so forth to make sure that uh, people stay current and, and things of that sort. Uh, you've been a good company. Uh, do you want to comment on where they've been over the past years in compliance? You want to have any, any as far as I know, they've been in compliance all they've along. They've been in complete compliance. That's what, They're that's one of the best companies for sending back information immediately. Excellent. I knew that was the answer I was going to get. I kind of already heard it. <laughs> uh, and um, Alamance County, it was also talked about 120,000 and other obligations. Uh, Alamance County is doing the 60,000 max. It's Mevin who's giving the other 60 and the other incentives. It's not Alamance County. Um, <coughs> Guys, I, I would like for us to approve this incentive, and I'll make the motion to do that. Well, is everybody done making comments? No. I, have, I have a lot of comments. All right. I, I saved my fire until the end. <laughs> Ms. Thompson, comments? Do you want to go first? Uh, um, I can start. I'm, I'm just concerned this is like the third time. That, that's, all, that's all, just from common sense of not multi-business person I'm just on the outside looking in at just the simple aspect of this and that's it and I'm, I'm just so thankful they're here they're amazing 
everything about them is awesome, but I, I do have concerns about it being like the third time is there going to be a fourth because uh, the more that's an excellent sign that they're growing and they're doing well, but that's also another um, financial aspect for our county and the citizens. So, Mr. Carter. Um, well, I have to agree with uh, our, our public speakers, uh, Mr. Vines and Mr. Uh, Mosier. Um, I've always been opposed to the concept of incentives. Um, however, I also realize the uh, reality of the, the business world, the reality of attracting uh, quality manufacturers and businesses to the community. Uh, it's a competitive environment, and sometimes we have to do what we have to do to make it work. Uh, my rule of thumb has always been that if the cash flow to the county was positive during that period of time, I would vote to support it. And uh, it appears to have a positive cash flow once again. So, um. Mr. Lashley? Well, I just want to um, throw out these numbers again. $600,000 computed at a maximum of 1% of the new proposed capital investment. 1% of 60 million is 600,000. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Vines is right. The county is going to have to pay. We're not going to have to pay anything. We're just going to get $120, $20,000 less from their tax bill times five is 600. I just want to thank the company for, for coming to Alamance County. Um, I'm always, I'm pro business. I, I love it when folks are successful in their business and You've been in business since 1932. That's very successful. You're coming up on 100 years. But I will say that I don't think you became, I don't think you are in business for 90 plus years if you weren't successful at your job. I think your business is so successful, successful you don't need our taxpayer money to expand your business. I'm like Mr. Carter. I, I'm against it based on fairness. We don't offer this to all our companies. They have to be a certain size and they have to be able to do certain things for us. Well, business and your business, you've proved to us and the world how successful your business are. As a business person, I would suggest to you that don't do it. You can stand on your own two feet. You don't need our taxpayers' money. I do like your business, and I think your business is very successful. And I want to say this to my other fellow commissioners, that this is a glaring example of why we need to work hard in making sure that we have a competitive business environment, that we continue to have a good business environment. And that's my basic goal. But I don't think that businesses make it your business is not going to fail if you don't get $1.2 million. Your business is extremely successful. And I would just ask you to, to not do that. You know, sh show, show Americans that you have our back, so to speak, that you are in it with us. I wish I could give you the incentives, but I am not, I cannot vote for incentives. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, I feel like some of the speakers said tonight. In the business that I've been in, if I didn't meet my obligations, guess what happened to me? Either I got fined from the company that I'm doing business with because I didn't fulfill my obligations. It was none of these things in which I can do half, and they give me half. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it worked for me. Um, this is a hard decision for me because I am pro-business, but I think that I don't want the taxpayers. The taxpayers have already shown you their consideration twice. And I think Ms. Thompson may be right that the third time is too much. But I just want to thank you so much for bringing this presentation to us. It was very informative and very educational. And if I can help you, and your company to take your to show you how great Alamance County is. Alamance County is wonderful, and I think that the reason why companies want to come here is we have a comparative advantage 
to the counties around us. Our tax rate is much lower than Orange County, Guilford County. Uh, only one's probably lower is Caswell. So we have a really good environment for people like you who want to come open up a business here. Uh, and I think the people in Alamance County will definitely um, support your business. As you can tell, they have for the last 14 years. I mean, uh, four years that they offered you, they uh, gave you money for to uh, expand your business. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, speakers said tonight, uh, Belgium is known of one of the highest taxes in the world. We don't have value added tax here. If you took your business to Belgium, would you have to pay a value added tax on construction of a new building after it's built? It's a fair question because the reason I asked that question is look on the other side. You're actually expanding the business, and the government's actually giving you money to offset. So there's a bit difference between Belgium and America as far as business is concerned. Taxes are, I can understand businesses taking consideration in taxes, and I can also understand why your company came to us to ask for this. Uh, I think as a, if I was a CEO of your company, it would be incumbent upon me to ask for this. I don't disparage you whatsoever from doing that. I think that's what you should do. But I just can't support it. And I want to thank you for your time and the presentation. And I want to thank you for the citizens of Alamance County for being here. And we hope you'll stay. And if there's any way I can help you, show you the benefits, why you should stay, I want you to reach out to me because I would like to help do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other commissioner comments? I have one more. Uh -oh. In addition to paying the world on taxes on $60 million, they're also going to pay uh, salaries, and there'll be different things. There'll be sales income tax, uh, excuse me, sales tax, revenues, and so forth. That's not the only thing they're paying. Sure. Uh, I continue my motion to approve the incentive. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other comments? All right. All in favor of this incentive, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. All right, Mr. County, uh, County Attorney, we have a 2-2 split. Motion fails. Thank you. General, I'm sorry. I appreciate you being here, and please stay with us. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Haygood. If I could just say this one quick thing, I would just like to make a request that you possibly get a, us a record of corporations and companies that have gotten the incentives in Alamance County and their success and failure rate for the last five plus years. Thank you. Can we can we go to ten? Uh, could I, you I get ten years? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, she asked if uh, Mr. Haygood could uh, compile a list of companies that they get the sentence to from the oh, county in the past yeah. 10 years. I mean, and, I'm and, new. And, I, I would love to and know And she's that. looking for um, sure. success rate? Success failure? and failure. Yeah. Just from my own personal being a brand new commissioner. Gentlemen, you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to leave your Thank you. Next item is the LMS Boys and School System Capital Funding Request. <coughs> Dr. Thorpe. Good afternoon. Good evening. Allergies. Hello. It's my time of year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that time of the year. It's so I come before you today to talk about our capital reserve funding and to make a request. Uh, to use funding for capital improvement items in our school district. I'm going to take these out of the mouth. Uh, one of the major issues uh, that we have throughout the district is roofing projects. Uh, Mr. Paisley and Ms. Thompson was here when we had some major failing at 
what, six of our schools. Mm -hmm. uh, these four schools are, as I talked to our engineer today, they are on the edge of being a total failure. Uh, they have been roofed twice. So there's nothing you can do now but tear off back to the deck and go back up with the uh, roofing, very much like your home. You, know, you can re-roof one time, then you go back to the sheeting. Uh, Woodlawn Middle, uh, High River. Woodlawn Middle's uh, basic 100% re-roof, uh, so single building. High River, uh, although there's two new wings, you have a older wing where the office is, where the cafeteria, going across to the gym owning, right there leaking, as well as the four buildings that sit on the uh, backside, there's the pods. Uh, Graham High School, you have a, it's a small section over the course room. Uh, that area, Graham Middle School, uh, if you remember, we did about half of it under the settlement. Uh, this is the remaining. They told us when we did the settlement, this, this part of the roof had about two to five years left and we're sitting about three. So uh, it is to the point of failure. Uh, I wish I could tell you this is all of them. This is the worst of them. We're spending money to have repairs made now, uh, which is just a waste of money. Uh, as you walk on the roof, uh, my roofers will tell you, you can see cracks and see areas that's going to leak again. Uh, it's just they've aged out. Uh, Dr. Mason, Thor, before yes. you take one step further, just in Ruth, sure. is it, will it, I know how Broadview was due to finances patched and patched, and, you know, just you do what you have to. With half a school is roofed, I mean, Baker Roofing did excellent jobs with the ones mm -hmm. that they did. Will that be okay to do the other half? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Are they going to be the same thing? They're going to be the same type of roof. They're going to. Okay. It's going to be like a whole new brand roof if you do half and half like you have. Okay, like at Hall River, you've got two sections there that the roof mm -hmm. is in really good shape. Yeah. You probably got another ten years there. Okay. Uh, we'll more than likely go back with a PVC. It's got a TPO roof on it. We'll more than likely go back with a PVC roof, but those two will marry together fine. Okay. And there won't be any issues. Uh, Graham High School, it is like a separate area, so that whole area will have a whole new roof on it. Uh, Graham Middle School, all the separate areas have roofs on it. Right now we're looking at the Media Center, center uh, the top of the two-story building, and um, the gym. And these aren't the cottage educational facilities known as double lives. No, ma'am. Those already have middle roofs on them. Great. Okay, the masonry project. Uh, this is what I showed you at Howe River where we got brick pulling away from the wall. Uh, I forgot I had already asked our engineers to give us, to give us a budget on that. Uh, so what they're looking at is removing what brick has to be removed, retying it back to the building, uh, doing the painting of some of the metal, the lintel work around the building. Uh, their assurances to us it will be there for another 50 years after they finish. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of work to make that happen. And let me slow you down there. That appeared to be mildew on the outside or some kind of mold or something. That's that where water work? is, one, the roof is failing, mm -hmm. so water is getting there behind your brick. And when it gets behind your brick, you're going to get that, that black mold and mildew. Uh, so after we get it fixed, we'll get it power washed off good. Uh, what happens with those spores and whatever they in treat the air? Them. They treat them. Before they yes sir yes sir everything sprayed and treated and power washed off and that's going to be safe yes sir yes sir we'll do it when kids are not present as well what about between the interior wall and the brick exterior of the brick as they remove it they'll be treated if they find any areas it'll be treated uh, to kill any mold or mildew spores so it doesn't continue to grow and gentlemen when we did the when we went on site years ago the strategic force we brought together there may have been one little spot somewhere but i mean it's marked it's like a giant cloud on every building it's it's the increase is, is scary it really is so moving right on to the road improvements it's going to be necessary for our bond project oh let me slow okay. you down sure. that 317 includes the mold and mildew remediation of the treatments Includes the entire package. Yes, sir. All the way from design, because we'll have to have engineering design on it. All the way from design to completion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. 
was glad okay. John asked that. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so for our road improvements, uh, as we've discussed before, our road improvements are required for us to get building permits uh, for these two projects. Uh, we were very fortunate these are the two projects that have road improvements. Eastern and Western have on-site improvements and not actual road improvements. Uh, at Southern Elements High School, although it's listed under the high school, the middle school is probably getting about half of those improvements uh, if you've picked up children in that area. It's not only dangerous, it's a little bit crazy. Uh, so this will allow us more queuing so we can get more people off the highway. And that's the key here is to get the queuing. Uh, it will involve a turn lane going into the school as well as a dedicated bus lot. As you know now, we share a bus lot with cars and everybody else, so it gives us a dedicated bus lot. Uh, then also as well, it, like I said, it gives parents on both sides the queuing that we're hopefully going to be able to get, everybody, or get the biggest majority of folks off the road. Why does <coughs> this cost not, for the new high school, not included in the bond monies? It's one of those, as we move forward with it, uh, if we'd included in the bond, we'd be short that much more on the bond. Uh, these are a reimbursable from the state at, as of today. So instead of using bond money, we decided to use capital reserve money or some form of other financing for that. Because uh, you'd kind of hate to spend bond money to get it reimbursed and you're sitting on it. Mm -hmm. um, right now from Tammy Jer Miller, I got an email from her today. We're discussing AO as far as her traffic pattern. Uh, as of today, she says there's, ro there's financing for off-road and on-campus improvements. That's as of today, I will make no guarantee Three years from now, the DOT will feel the same, or the law will change. Right now, we have a law, a general statute that supports DOT paying for these improvements. I support that too, if they ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they would like to know. I was. Uh, new high we school. Got a brush. Gasoline tax. That's right. That's right. Uh, new high school, uh, about a half a million. Uh, we're going to put a turn lane in there. And I would like to add, just because I just come off the Board of Ed, I've, I've went through all these long, tenuous studies and all this stuff. Um, Dr. Thorpe has probably talked to probably about 700 parents that go to Southern Metal because of the traffic. How we have not had someone really harmed there with, it's just hold your breath and turn, hold your breath and turn. And that, that's a really good improvement to think about that. That's been a real danger. This has come from qualified engineers who have done quality counts. There's probably a 400 page report sitting on my desk to how these yeah. was determined. How long will something like that take to uh, like to get the train lane? How long does something like that take from start to finish? The, from start to finish on the turn lane, I would say probably about seven months, eight months. Uh, you know, the whole process will be over a two year period because okay. we'll have to phase it in. But we can't shut the parking lots down and the road down at the same right. time. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll move on to the new high school. Yeah, as we said uh, before, we put things as alternate at the new high school to make sure we can get it in at budget. Um, let me get the right picture so I'm talking about the right thing. Uh, the vocational building is one of the alternates. It is um, a 6,644-square-foot building. It has two uh, classrooms, two shops, a storage area, and unisex toilets. It will be for your animal science and your carpentry classes. Now, neither one of those are offered <coughs> over at SeaTac. No, sir. Neither one of those are offered at SeaTac. Right now, they are offered at Southern High and Eastern. And let me rephrase that animal science is offered at Southern. At Eastern, you have carpentry, and at Western, you have carpentry. Uh, from talking with our CTE people, uh, those classes are well filled up as they put a cap on them of about 20 to 25 kids because uh, there's a lot of safety issues going on in those classes so kids sometimes have to go on waiting list or 
uh, other measures have to be taken for those classes. Uh, with this pulling from the southern area as well as the eastern area, we're hoping that these trade classes continue to be a um, an option for children. Uh, you know, as we've talked before, individually and maybe as a group, that you know the reason things are so high right now, we don't have kids, we don't have folks going into the trades, and limited resources or limited workforce out there. Well, are these classes offered at ACC. You would have to go through our what what we would envision. Let me just tell you what I what I would envision is conversations we've had in the district. You have level one and level two courses, and level three courses. You typically want children taking those first two level of courses that are homeschool. One, to make sure they can do it, and two, to make sure they really want to do it. So what you'd hope for is by the time they're juniors, uh, we're able to get them into level, at least level three courses and or ACC uh, to continue their education so when they walk away, they have these, uh, the background for general contractors, for electrical trades, plumbing trades, mm -hmm. because we don't offer the individual trades, but ACC would. So you know, jumping on our, our opportunity and our partnership with ACC is where we'd take push that to. Is there a possibility of getting a youngster in high school to the point at which he could go out and attain a plumbing license or a electrical license? Or we, we, that, that would be a, a go. Um, because once they complete their level three, level four, level three courses, if they choose to go sit for the exam, uh, they can go sit once they turn 18 and they have the financial responsibilities required because different licenses require different financial right. responsibilities. Uh, so once they did that, yes, sir. Okay. So someone 18 could be sitting for their license for certain areas and 21 for, for certain trades as well. I've had several people in the construction industry approach me and talk about the fact that they having a very difficult time finding qualified tradespeople in the community. And uh, I think that's something important that we can work on because if a kid really does not feel the inclination to spend four years in college, he's had all the, so to speak, book learning he wants for a while. I mean, some of those folks can get out of high school and start making as much as $80,000 a year. That's kind of crazy. So, Well, I did pull our kind of our pathways for these, these two different programs, which we got pathways for our programs. With uh, architecture and construction, you know, you got carpentry career path, you got drafting and architectural career path, you got electrical trades career path, you got inter interior design careers path. Walking out of high school, you can be a construction laborer, carpenter, or electrical power line worker just walking out of school. Uh, certified, cert excuse me, certificated or associate's degree for architectural draftsman, civil engineer technician, uh, bachelor's degree or higher, and this is where really the good money's being made is in construction management right now. A lot of young folks are graduating, and I'll pick on Appalachian because I'm old automata. Um, yeah, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you have that effect on me. Uh, yeah, y'all have that effect on me every time. Uh, and y'all know I'm shy and bashful, so. Uh, so construction manager, cost estimators, uh, civil engineers, interior designers, and architects. So that's the pathway for the construction piece. Uh, animal science, which I first thought veterinarian, zoologist, right. those things, it goes much deeper than that. Uh, you have an animal science career path, food products and processing systems career path, plant systems career path, power structure and technology systems career pathway out of high school. Uh, pesticide handler, farm equipment, farm equipment mechanic, greenhouse farm worker, food service, full designer, uh, cer uh, certificate programs or associate degrees, vet tech, food science technicians, forest conservation technicians, and if they choose to go on further, you got zoologists, wildlife biologists, natural sciences, environmental engineer, and veterinarians. So those two actually offer a lot of pathways for kids. And yet, I noticed they only have wildlife officer in there, which mm -hmm. that would be a pathway that could mm -hmm. So those programs are could be critical for our community, as well as the success of a lot of our kids. Dr. Thor, <clears throat> quick question. Okay. I, I thank you for that. It kind of gives some perspective to what these 
programs that, that we could offer at the vocational building. Uh, but my question deals with the strategic plan for the that was presented when we approved the new high school, when we, for the previous board and the, and the voters approved the new high school, uh, which is that Graham would become sort of a magnet school for vocations. Um, and would these programs under that plan be available at Graham? And if so, why why is that? Or are we deviating from the strategic plan that we had initially thought we were following? What um, my thoughts and understandings with that would be, again, they would get the beginning level courses at their home high school, kind of like we use CTEC, kind of like we use other schools for, and they would go there for their more advanced level courses. To Graham? Or to, to Graham. ACC? To Graham. And then after they finish with Graham, you know, hopefully they got a year left, they can go to ACC. Does that mean that the higher level of vocational courses that are currently at Western and at Southern would move to Graham? A portion of them would. I think we. Would, I think because of the number of participants we have, we're going to have to hang on to a few of those schools in order to service all the kids mm -hmm. that we have interested in those programs. I mean, you'd be surprised at the number of kids who, uh, especially the construction. You did a survey base. on that, I believe. How, what was the re response numbers I, to it? I do not have those. I'll be honest with you. Is this building more expensive than just a two-room classroom building? Otherwise, it's a, it's a typical expense. Okay. And do you know if the operating costs for this alternate is included in the estimates that have already been provided? It is. It would be because uh, your teachers will come off your state, which is done per ADM. Uh, there'd be no additional clerical into that area. Just a so you'd utilities? Have your, just, yeah, utilities. Question I've got is. You have three point two four six well three million two hundred and forty six thousand two hundred and eight extra dollars you're asking for. Now I understand that uh, five hundred and twenty three thousand of that may be reimbursed by DOT. But that still leaves two million seven hundred and twenty two million dollars. Two million seven hundred and twenty two thousand dollars. Uh, extra monies. Why were they not included in the initial bond referendum? Okay, all this was included into our original packages. What we had to do as you started value engineering, as we've discussed, cost of stuff has gone up and the money has stayed the same. So you start looking at things that are there another way of doing it and accomplishing a similar goal, maybe not a better goal, but a similar goal. And let me get through the items. I think I can... All right. Uh, maybe clarify better that way. Let me ask a quick question. Sure. On something I, I may have misunderstood. Are not the Southern High School and the new high school road improvements both refundable? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. we can apply so for both of them. Instead of 500000 it'd be 2226000 well, It'd be 2722000 yeah. That we're asking for additional. Additional. 2.2 2 is going to be refunded. No, it's right there. Right. Uh, we're, going, we're going to apply for it and request yeah. it. Yes, sir. How long does something like that take? I mean, the, do they make the wait till you uh, have it? It has completed? to be completely in, and we have to have receipts in hand. Uh, yeah. Elon, it was refunded it's after we finished. The How long does it take them? Does the state sure. come and do that for you? To, to, does st someone from the state come down and take a look and rubber stamp it and write yeah, you a check? For the, well, yeah, well, you know. For lack of a better. Yeah, yeah. They put it in there, and then later on we get a check. Yes, okay. sir. All right. As I was just curious, uh, you said it was going to take two years to build the road. I was just curious, like, what, maybe after the road's built, yeah. The state pays you back in what six, within six months? Or? I would say within six months we should be able to receive that. And, and where will that money go when they reimburse it? Would it come back into your capital reserves or will it? Uh, I would highly recommend it come back into the county, into the capital reserves for future needs. Okay. Just, just curious. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's what, that would be my recommendation. Sure. Thank you. I'm saying that. That's why I'm bringing it out. Two seven and two three. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have one additional comment, uh, Ms. Thorpe. This is not your directed to you. Uh, normally, um, with issues of this sort, uh, it would be issued. It would actually be sent to the uh, Technical Review Committee and then to the Capital Oversight Committee. 
Um, why has that not been done in this case? Well, for some of this, there's some urgency in us to have these discussions, um, especially with the new high school. Uh, we are looking at um, going under contract. And the last thing you want to do is start doing a lot of change orders. Uh, change orders become costly to everybody. So you know, we, we're, in the, we're kind of in a situation where we need to have the conversation uh, to, to push through the, the list. Uh, tennis courts uh, with lights. I think uh, Ms. Thompson can share with you that's a, that can be a big issue at the schools. Mm -hmm. It was not something that we desperately would have to have, uh, but it does become an issue within the school. Uh, soccer field. Excuse me, the tennis courts weren't already included in the plan, right? They, they were included as an alternate. Not in the original scope of work, not in the base scope of work. Correct. Uh, you got soccer lights. Uh, this is opportunity if you're going to put lights on that field to do it. Uh, while you have resources setting on site. Uh, additional student parking, there's an area that's right now is not in pavement. You've got polished concrete in two areas. This is an add-on to what VCT would cost you, so it's $56,000 more. The advantage of polished concrete, it'll be there a long time after VCT has been replaced multiple times. What's a VCT? Uh, tile. Okay. I don't know you <laughs> uh, your FRP doors that is a higher quality door than what we had originally planned so for 10 grand you're putting doors in that you're less likely to have to replace in the short term explain the difference it's just a, I'll can tell you it's a higher quality door uh, it takes abuse much more than a the typical door if we use typical metal doors we use it will take the abuse a whole lot better as kids nowadays when they go outdoors they hit them they kick them they do whatever going out so it will help preserve those doors so we're not replacing them as quick Todd does that have any kind of safety aspect to it too is that better safety more reinforced it'd be a stronger, it'd be a stronger okay. door okay uh, then we would recommend that we do with PVC roofing over TPO PC PVC roofing um, TPO will do the same thing uh, PVC is going to last you longer, it's more durable, easier, easier, more economical to patch. So I'm going to switch on over to, I'm ahead of myself here, I might keep it up in the PowerPoint. You might have had, had a couple of interruptions. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the way I, that's the way I function. Um, Okay, this, this page, if you look, uh, your tennis courts, your athletic fields, your soccer fields, if you put LED lights in, LEDs uh, use a tremendous amount less energy, uh, less likely to have to replace them in the short term. Um, but again, this is the time if you're going to do it. You got everything on site, you're, you can make it happen if you put up the others. When you get a change out, you may end up changing the actual fixture itself. Uh, then motorized bleachers and auxiliary gym. Right now we have pull-out bleachers. Uh, motorized bleachers, what you do find out with those, it sounds strange, but the bleachers last longer mm -hmm. because nobody's grabbing them and jerking them and pulling on them that way. So they do last much longer. So here are the projects. Uh, our board looked at them last week and requested that we go and come to you and ask for the 9.6 million. Yes. Uh, Dr. Thorpe, a couple other questions. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that with respect to the new high school that there are some time sensitive decisions that need to be made. Um, I would assume that if the board decides to fund the vocational building, the tennis courts, that requires 
additional site work or different site work than if the board did not approve those. Is that accurate? The, is that fair? It's minimal site work because that additional is built into these numbers. Okay. Where it gets very expensive is if we let this equipment off the site and right. we decide we're going to do it, then we had to pay for the mobile. You know, you charge the mobilization right. charge and everything else. So when does when all things being equal, when does mobilization of the site begin? More than likely next week, full mobile mobilization. Okay. After our, after our board approves the contracts. And how long does mobilize? How, how long does site work last? That site is basically a neutral site as far as having import or export soils. Right. So it's basically a neutral site. Uh, you're, we have not sat, we do not have the final schedule. I'll say probably within 90 days, they'll be completing that. But now on the front side of that, if we choose to do it, or let me rephrase that, if we choose not to do it, uh, the site work will be changed that's what I mean that the, the actual scope of the site work will have to change right if we do it while they're there the scope is pretty much on the plans as it reads now uh, some issues you run into is we are required to have different drainage ponds and uh, your environmental stuff so we'd have to see how all that works and also the last thing we'd want to do is put non-compatible soil into those areas if we thought we were going to actually build a building you could do the site work as if you were going to build the buildings and the tennis court and then not actually build the building, building and the tennis court. I'm going to say yes, but I'm also going to caveat that we would have to go back to our civil engineers to make sure we don't have issues with runoff or erosion. The only reason I'm asking that is just to determine what kind of timeline we're talking about. Right. Having to make a decision. Uh, if, if you had to do the site work that you needed to, if you had to decide whether or not to go forward with all of the project, by the time the mobilization ended, are you saying that we need to make that decision within 90 days or do we need to make it before then? My opinion, yes. uh, from talking with the architects and engineers, it needs to be made before then because when they right. start moving dirt, they, they want to know where it's going. They want right. to know what they're doing with it. Uh, what are we getting permits for? What are we... You know, the whole the whole scope of work. So would you say can you give it can you give it an estimate of when that decision really needs to be made in order to decide how to how to move the dirt and how not to move the dirt? I mean do we have two weeks? Do we have thirty days? Do we have forty five days? I would say you have probably about thirty days if it come down to making the decision. It would be a change order onto the contract. Um, so that would be the that would be the biggest hurdle there. But but you could you could still you could still accept an alternate. I mean, it's technically not a change order if you accept the alternate. If I accept the alternate, I got to have money in the the bank to pay for it, or I, you know we wouldn't be here. Right. I mean, I'm not you know, not being right. funny, but if I accept it and put in that contract, right, I got to have cash in hand. Uh, to accept it without cash in hand would be would make it a change order, and then the price uh, might be the alternate price, or it might be a different price. Correct. Based on plywood, I bet it'll be different. Because <laughs> everything I've seen, I mean, it's going to be like $9,000 for one sheet. That's it. It's ridiculous. Subcontractors are struggling right now I to bet. lock prices in. Which uh, means we are. What? We are struggling. We need to lock prices in. Now, the sensitivity, time sensitivity issue, too, is different for some of these pieces. For the, the, the road improvements you're talking about before you sign a contract which is up to be signed, correct? Versus site improvements, you're talking maybe 30 days. So when you when you look at what, what's been presented tonight, you know, your roofing projects need to get underway. Your masonry projects need to get underway. Your road work improvement, we've got to have that availability prior to pulling permits because we've got to have permits to uh, start this construction. Do all of our other high schools have tennis courts? Williams doesn't. Williams, they play at the aquatic Graham, center. Pardon? Williams doesn't. They have to play at the aquatic center, which means you have to schedule. So Williams doesn't, nor does Graham. Right, but they're kind of. Western does, apart. Eastern does. Western, Eastern, Cummins. Southern, Southern. Cummings. 
and they're all of them have lighted facilities. This would be the first soccer field that we have a light on. I think with soccer becoming such a popular sport, uh, we're going to be pushed more and more to start creating separate fields for soccer because soccer shares a lot of times with football. football. Williams has li lighted soccer fields. Do it. Williams High School has them. Yeah. Yes. They play on the football field. Yeah, kind of on the football field. field. Is this a, so a practice soccer field or a play soccer field? Or it, would become, it, it could be both. It would more than likely be both. With stands, I mean. But they would be some form of stands. They're probably aluminum bleachers. Okay. It wouldn't be like a grandstand of a football field typically. But if you didn't have lights, it would be a practice soccer field and they play soccer on a football stadium Correct. for games. When is your next school board meeting? Next Monday night. All right. And that's the point at which you plan to approve the final contract to construct the high school? We should have a GMP there. As you know, yeah, this is it's sensitive that we get started. Uh, we've got timelines to meet, and if we really want this high school in June of 2023, we've got some quick deadlines to meet. Uh, otherwise, we may be sitting on high school for a year with no one in it. When did this matter come before the school board? When was the vote taken on, by the school board? Last Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. And the vote there was? Five uh, to two. To accept or to, for us to come forward. All right. Five to two. The, five, the to five to two. two. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, how long did that board have to study this issue before they had to take that vote? When was it presented to the school board? This has been, pieces of this have been presented throughout the process. Uh, this formal document was presented to them uh, as part of the school board packet for the Tuesday meeting. And when was that presented to the school board? I think our school board meetings go live on Tuesday. No, no. When was the package presented Tuesday. to the school board? Tuesday. 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 The same day that they took the vote? Yes, sir. Okay. So they didn't have much time to study it? It's been well, studied for probably the last year. <laughs> and different question. things yeah. comes along. That's what I'm saying. In pieces, we've, this is the right. formal. This is the first time it's been put in a complete formal document. But pieces of this has been discussed and throughout. The, well, excuse me, with the board throughout. The and if year, one thing I can remember is we were told when I was on the board, y'all need to make your minds up now. You need to look at everything they're telling you. You need to make sure you want the toilet here or you want the sink there because you women don't need to come up and change your mind when we're getting ready to dig up a piece of dirt. So it, it's been real methodical into making definite decisions. Architects, we've asked them questions we, before, asked all these questions because you just don't do all this and all of a sudden, oh, no, I, don't, I think I want it on the left side. That's so much money. You, you just can't do that. It's not like putting up a storage building in your backyard. So, I mean, I, I can have to stand by the school system. They have really went over this to death. <coughs> how many gravel, how much pavement, how much toilets, doors. I mean, it was really nitpicky, but it has to be because folks voted on a bond for this and they, they want this done. And um, the snooze you lose. It's, I'm, I'm hearing all this hesitation. I'm wondering where this is coming from because we've known this for a long time. I mean, the Alamance County voted on this because of the shape of many of the buildings and needing in high school because of overcapacity. Trust me, and transfer appeals. Everybody wants to go to one school and you watch people just tear up when they can't. So no kid needs to dread going to a particular school. They want to go where they want to go. But um, this, is, this has been this is beat a dead horse, and I don't. And I, Tony Rose used to say that to me all the time. I just want to pop him, but I didn't say that. But um, it's it's the truth. You know, you have to get those things in concrete, literally, because they're too expensive to just have a whim of changing your mind. So um, I'm on this side and that side. I just, you know. Let me respond to that. I'm on issue. that side, John, so I know you're coming from that side, and you're supposed to, and I appreciate that. But I went through it, so I feel like I can tell you that with a real understanding it being real personal. So um, I, I've seen every, every plan, every map, every plan. I guess the thing that bothers me in response to your, your yeah. comment, one, we've got the... Uh, well, to me, not a bond sitting out there. Absolutely. We sell bonds the 20th of this month. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Because, yeah. 
Exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll soon know what kind of money we have. We don't know that today. Right. And they're going to pull their reserve monies down to what less than a hundred thousand dollars. No, what it's is not it? true. What is enough? That's my biggest uh, thing I want to say. Um, it's really easy to help people. Uh, do these projects, but I was in the meeting Tuesday night at school where I mean, they didn't know how much money was in the, in the account. They asked me. Oh. And I looked back at my notes and found a number that apparently today is not, not accurate. That concerns me quite a bit. Now, the only reason being is this accountability, and I'm not talking personal, I'm talking accounting. It would make our job a whole lot easier if we had account numbers that we could actually access and look at and see how the money's flowing through it. And the only reason I say that is because that's how I keep track of stuff. I can't keep, I, I can't, I'm going to have to go back with these things here and go back and look at my notes and mesh things together. I don't agree that it's been clear. Uh, I have so many things that I pulled in to try to figure out, do I have notes to allocate to that number? And I don't. And there's a reason why. If you don't know how much money you have in your savings account, how much money you know how to spend? That's my only question. I mean, you got $24 million in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot of money. And uh, I read something from your finance director that he said that the reason why that account got so inflated was the taxpayer's been paying seven cents more in taxes and to pay as we go, correct? Yep. That's, how, that's how the whole thing got started. Well, it's funny that I looked the whole entire weekend and I'm having a difficult time figuring out where $20.6 million is spent. I mean, I'm just having a hard time. now. I'll be more than happy to sit down with you and, and, and walk through it. I understand the schools have needs, but I have reservations about the numbers that are in front of me. Uh, not saying anything's bad or anything's wrong, it's just there's a lot of confusion here. And I reason that confusion is coming, what I'm saying to you, Dr. Thorpe, is what people are telling me. There's a lot of confusion that we got 150 million bucks for a bond, and then now we're doing additional stuff don't understand that at all. I mean, did when when the bond came out, did they say they were going to put soccer fields and soccer lights and all those things in there? I mean, it's just a it's a logical question that taxpayers have asked me and I don't have an answer for them. Mr. Lashley, if I might. Sure. Back and forth. <clears throat> so, Mr. Lashley, the, the the estimates that were put together to um, to put the bond out mm -hmm. were based upon rough orders of magnitude and sure. what those construction costs were going to be. And so they were, and I won't say best guess, but a best estimate at the time with the information that was available. And so you know, you know what happens after that is that we, we get closer and closer to what the actual sure. construction is going to look like, what uh, challenges are we going to have with property in the case of the new, of, of the new school. And so there, there are expected to be some fluctuations oh, over, sure. over time. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, I think that the, initially um, the estimates that we had said we would be able to accomplish all of those things for $150 million. Uh, as we've gotten more specific information about the, the, the projects themselves and the work that needed to be done at the building, those have been, uh, had to be adjusted and they're closer to what actual costs will be, of course, until we sign a contract sure. and get going. I don't know if that will actually be the number or or not. The, um, the information on the new high school, including pulling the CTE building off as an ad alt, it, as long, along with those other improvements, had been presented to the board in a couple of different contexts prior to the board seeing them right. uh, at this last and at this last meeting. And you mean the school board? The school board, I yes. Agree. And I then agree. and the CTE building is the vocational the the the, the vocational. Vocational, vocational building, vocational. career and technical education, and we're building a comprehensive high school, right? Mm -hmm. We we need a comprehensive set of programs for our students, so you have to have some option for career and technical education at the home school with an opportunity to, to work you know, at a higher level at mm -hmm. other places within the school system or when a you know, partnership with, um, with, it, with ACC. So that part of it, absolutely the board has seen, has seen previously. We on an annual basis bring to the board other projects that are, are in need based upon an analysis by Dr. Thorpe and our engineers, uh, including the roofing projects that are being proposed um, uh, as, a, as a part of our ask this, e this evening. 
I, I agree, Mr. Paisley, that, that, that under any other circumstances, I would love to see all of this get funneled through the Technical Review Committee and the Oversight Committee. I think we've got a great collaborative way to manage those resources and be very transparent within, within our community. But we're kind of just getting started with that model. That's a new model for us, and, and there's more work to be done there. Um, uh, I, I think it's, we've done great work so far, and I appreciate all of the heavy lifting that uh, Mr. Haygood and Andrea have done to, to pull that all together so for us to work together. But there's more to do there, including, including probably looking at how to prioritize projects in an agreed-upon way so that there aren't surprises. So we're, we're in a better place than we have been, I think, probably, well, I haven't been here but three years, but I'll say <laughs> at least in the three years that I've been here, we're in a better place. Um, but but you know, not exactly where we, we would like to be. But there are, there are some issues here. Um, I have, have built a new high school, built a new elementary school, uh, 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 shovels in the ground, two years to open. That's a tight timeline. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Dr. Mason, I had a quick question, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, I, and, and this is not specific to the conversation here, but, but I think it helps give the board a broader, I guess, approach that this fits into. And that's the school board today was doing some strategic planning for your for pro, uh, programming, I guess. A new strategic plan for right. Our, our strategic plan runs out at the end of, of, of June, so we're reprioritizing, and that was part of a retreat that we had today to, to begin to look at some of the draft framing around that new plan. And last time Dr. Thorpe was here, we talked about how it would be great to have some dedicated list of priorities for strategic for capital improvements. Um, which I think would help the board, which would help mm -hmm. your board. Is there a similar strategic plan that we could develop or that is being developed for, for capital improvements within the school system so that whether we use the, the processes that we've developed with the school board, I can't remember the name of the committee, but whether we use that or don't use that, that we have a grand plan that we all can sign off on so that we don't have surprises like this in the future. Well, I think that is the way we are managing capital improvement. It's just that we're, we're, we've got a ways to go. We haven't been doing it for very long together. Mm -hmm. Having a technical review committee uh, to be followed up by an oversight committee, a plan then that gets adopted by both boards that has a seven-year look at what that's, we're trying to accomplish. Yes. And, and, and then, you know, we agree that that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. and, and barring, you know, emergencies, things that fail that need to be um, uh, repaired immediately and having to reprioritize we commit to to getting those things done with within the funds that are made available uh, it, it's it, you know, it cannot be about us always asking for more because it, it's always it could always be more and it's it should not be right I, and I think the issue right now for us is that we are still catching up and so you look at these roofing projects where the engineers are saying we're near failure with the roofing projects. There's an, an immediacy that has to occur in, re, in repairing those roofs. Once we get caught up, we should be able to sustain what we're doing by applying a percentage of the replacement cost of our facilities in our, our cash capital, our PAYGO capital. And, I, and that's, that's really what I think we're trying to, to work toward. But we're, we're playing a little catch up here still. We'd like to remind the board, um, one, Dr. Benson, thank goodness, will be in front of us again Wednesday at our budget hearing. The Technical Review Committee meets on April the 27th, mm -hmm. and the Oversight Committee um, is scheduled to meet, I think, April 29th. So all these uh, committees are meeting in the immediate future. Um, I'm just disturbed that Tuesday, Board, school board members were presented with this d disaster of nine plus million dollars uh, and then it comes to us Mr. Hey good when Tuesday afternoon Wednesday and so first we knew that there was an emergency for over nine million dollars and you're going to bring down your um, current balance to a low number uh, in the immediate and then we have bonds that go on sale tomorrow to cover a lot of cost. Uh, it just bothers me that we're not going through the normal process with these two committees. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. That's just I, where I, I understand. I, I understand, Mr. Paisley, and I, I would just suggest that it's a new normal for us as a collaborative group, a group working together. That that's not a structure that was in in, in place uh, a little over two years ago. The, but it was there last Tuesday. Yes, sir. It was. Uh, as were the cost projected cost overruns for the new high school. As were the failing roofs. Yes, sir. It, if we were to wait. Till May, there's a meeting, May, a commissioner meeting May 3rd. Is that, is that right? March that is 3rd. correct. That would get us through technical review. That would get us through oversight. That's a two week delay. It gets us the bonds issued so we know what the numbers are concretely. Dr. Thorpe, how does a two week delay in signing the contract that may include, include alternatives rather than change orders affect the going forward with this high, new high school project? As far as two weeks, if it's just a true two weeks, we're fine. Uh, what would end up happening is our board would have to call a special call meeting to approve that uh, change order to that contract. Well, would they be change orders if, 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 we, if we waited to sign the, the main contract until after the May 3rd meeting here? Couldn't you sign one contract that included the alternatives that, that the board approved? That would be a conversation I need to have with Samit Construction since there's a cement risk contractor on there and what their timeline is. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't want them to say it's our fault. That something didn't come in when it needed to, so I would have to check with them. But you know, for that short period of time, if it was a change order, it would not. I don't think it would change the value of these projects. That at least provides some opportunity for these structures that we've created to handle situations like this to operate. Say good. Do you have a recommendation? Well, I, I would like to just make sure that. The commissioners understand very clearly where we are with capital reserve uh, for the school system. So uh, we met today, Susan and Andrea and I, and uh, our plan said that we would be at $22,787,425 at the end of this current fiscal year in the school system's capital reserve. That's a planned dollar amount based on uh, the property tax that was put in effect early before we started making debt service payments for the bonds, as well as uh, sales tax uh, revenue that we've been putting away before the debt service started. So we actually think because of uh, the, the, how well sales tax is doing this year, right, uh, and our property tax revenues are higher than we thought, we believe that the school system at the end of the fiscal year, their capital reserve amount will be approximately, this is an estimate, $24,542,200. So if the commissioners do approve spending what the school system has requested, $9,623,073 from their capital reserve. Uh, that, that's been the request. Uh, if the schools, I mean, if the commissioners do that, we would estimate that the capital reserve for the school system at the end of this current fiscal year would be $14,919,127 at the end of the fiscal year. It's important to understand that after this, the end of this fiscal year, our plan says we, we don't add to capital reserve anymore. We start taking out of capital reserve to make uh, old debt service payments, new debt service payments, make sure they get their uh, $3.3 .3 million CIP. And so over a period of five years, the next five years, the plan calls for a drawdown on capital reserve. And that drawdown in the plan is $9,170,826 to be drawn down out of school systems capital reserve to pay for their debt service and their uh, CIP. So if you, our estimate would be if you, uh, if we go by the plan and all these numbers work according to the plan and we draw down the, the nine million plus dollars to pay their debt and the commissioners give them the $9.6 million that they're asking for to do these additional projects, we would estimate based on plan revenues that uh, the school system's uh, capital reserve would uh, become $5,748,301 in fiscal year 25-26, right? So now the, you have to understand that these are all estimates. This is the best numbers that we have today. We do issue debt tomorrow. So these estimates are gonna change tomorrow. As mm -hmm. Soon as we actually issue debt, we know our true debt service payment, we know what the par really is, how the premium that we've talked about is gonna affect it we'll be able to run a new scenario that plugs all that information in. So it could be more or less than $5.7 million uh, in 25-26, that, that's possible. And it's also important to know uh, that we're using conservative revenue estimates for sales tax, 
and for property tax. So it's, it's possible if we continue to see this economic boom that we've been in, they're going to have more than 5.7 million in capital reserve at the end. But that's the best numbers we have right now. We will have better numbers tomorrow. So I just want to make sure that uh, everyone understands that. I also talked with um, Susan, uh, and unfortunately Susan's not here this evening, but she wanted to be sure that I communicated to the commissioners that uh, if approved, the $9,623,073 for ABSS capital projects would not actually be available due to cash flow until after uh, May 7th when the bond sale is finalized. We have fronted the school system funding, so we have to replenish their capital reserve. They use some reimbursement resolution. I've talked with Andrea. I think it's possible that we could figure out a way to put money in the capital reserve if we absolutely had to before May 7th. But uh, Susan feels confident that May 7th we will be reimbursing the capital reserve for money that we fronted once we right. issue the bond debt. So uh, that's a lot to say, I know, but I want to make sure that's that's very clear. The new estimate, $24.5 million, all things considered, if this if this request for the 9.6 million new projects uh, is, is funded, uh, we'd be looking at about $5.7 million being the low point of the school system's capital reserve in 25-26. Again, all things being equal, that's a lot of play. A lot of revenues can change, and, and things will be a lot clearer tomorrow. So. Do your numbers include an assumption that we get reimbursed by the DOT? Uh, they do not. And I think what I would suggest is if, if, uh, if the commissioners uh, decide to allocate the $9.6 million for the school systems project request, we would want to, uh, I'd want to know from the commissioners if you agree that you would want that reimbursement to come back into the school systems capital reserve. If so, we'd want to structure a motion to that effect and then work with the school system to make sure that that happens. So it, it would depend on who paid those bills. It could be us, it could be the school system. I think right now, uh, for the school system, we're paying a lot of the bills to avoid them through through you when we use the capital reserve, which is fine. But we would want to be sure that was clear. Uh, it sounds like it's possible, but not a guarantee that DOT would uh, reimburse those funds. But you know, if the commissioners wanted to do it that way, uh, I would certainly suggest that that would be very reasonable. Put the money back into the school system's uh, capital reserve, and again, that those capital reserves are for if we have an economic downturn. If we do have a crisis or an emergency at a uh, school system facility, you can use them for that. If you have cost overruns on the original bond projects or on any of these other projects, that's your, you know, your capital reserve is good for all of those, those uses. Lord, I'm going to move that we postpone this vote until the May 3rd meeting and immediately refer this to both the Technical Review Committee and the Capital Oversight Committee uh, for their next meetings each. If we do that, one will have the numbers for uh, the bond sales tomorrow, which will make a tremendous difference. Two, the Technical Review Committee and the Capital Oversight Committee will have seen all this, and according to Mr. Thorpe, if I understood correctly, two weeks is not going to make that, you know, it's not going to be that critical. <clears throat> so I'll move that we postpone this to the May 3rd meeting with it going to those two committees in the interim. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Exactly what are these two committees going to do? They're going to look at all the hard numbers mm -hmm. and determine, what one, what it's really going to cost us. Two, by that time we'll have the, uh, the bond numbers. Sales take place tomorrow. It's going to give us a lot of information that we simply or it's impossible for us to know today. And who is they? Who's on the committee? Mm -hmm. Te yeah. Technical oh. technical Two review is, is is staff and finance from, the, staff. from the county, our staff, county and, our and staff. ACC. Overview, oversight committee includes two members from the board of commissioners, two school board members, a trustee. And that's Mr. Carter and myself. Yes. And so there's, we have good representation across the two committees, and that's their purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Is to is to look at the projects and and make recommendations or adjustments and try to fit that in within the, within the financial model that is available to this to us. Mr. Paisley, if I could just offer just a little sure. bit more information, I am I'm I am I am just I am concerned about the new high school specifically, right? And the timeline that we have to open it. You know, have the school turned over to us in June of 23 such that we can add students in it uh, in, in, in that fall. And I know uh, from experience that uh, once you get behind in construction, uh, you tend to stay behind in construction. 
And so I would just offer for the board's consideration the, the possibility of perhaps you're looking at the high school differently, just the, new, the money for the new high school and the road improvements, <laughs> that, that perhaps we could get that going for your consideration. Kind of hard to argue with them. I, I don't have I'll make a motion to amend, the, amend your motion to allow for the funding for the mm -hmm. road improvements to the new high school at tonight's meeting. And I, as the mover, I consent to that as well. A question, uh, Dr. Benson. Your concern was just on the road improvements? Yes. For the new high school. For the new high school. Which was around 200,000? Look at the numbers. Uh, yeah. Half a million. Uh, Give us the numbers, Mr. Road, road improvements? 523.60. Yeah, it's a half a million. And, and just another question, Dr. Benson, after consulting with Dr. Thorpe, you're still okay with a two-week delay in signing a contract for the new high school? As I said, we'll, we will probably, I'm going to talk with Sammet, we'll probably go ahead and do the original change order for the new uh, maximum price with the understanding that a third change order will come uh, within a three-week period. And but the new maximum price, you mean the road improvements? No. What do you mean the new maximum price? A new, uh, okay, if approved, the right. third change order would go in to change the maximum price. Should sure they come up with alternate contracts? Uh, we just have to, it's just a change order. When you start, uh, when you start this, it's just a change order. It's not, if we do it early on, like I said, if you tell me in two to three weeks we're going to have a firm decision, uh, you're talking minimal time on site. If you're telling me three months, I'm going to tell you it's going to cost you a fortune to go back and make those changes. And I, I, I'm sure Mr. Turner and I have dealt with many, many, many construction contracts. And so we're, uh, but I would also beg you guys to have pretty stringent timelines that are enforceable financially if they're penalties. Uh, make sure that your guys meet their deadlines. Is there a liquidated um, damages provision for delay? They are. Every, every one of our contracts, uh, really, no matter how small until you get into the $100,000 range, uh, has substantial penalty buybacks if they don't meet the time. But there's also typically a lot of negotiation that goes into um, getting some resolution around those issues, whether it is weather days that cause right. the delay or, and sometimes it's not cash penalty, it's, it's, you get something else. Uh, a soccer field, maybe. <laughs> and we'll have to track the days. We've done it before. You track every day, whether it's workable conditions or non-workable conditions. With respect to your uh, the discussion on your motion, Mr. Chairman, I'd be inclined to support it. I, I would just uh, I wouldn't want to go past the two weeks. I agree. I will have to zoom with you on the May second meeting. I'll be in Texas. Uh, but it's a morning meeting, so I will have to zoom with you. If it's evening meeting, I could possibly make it. <laughs> Our meeting's on the third. Mm -hmm. so I think it's on the third. That's Tuesday. Monday. 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 Yes, I'll definitely be in Texas. Texas. And you're inviting us to go. No. Come on, go with me. <laughs> Come on, go with me. It's three days of nothing but construction. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I ask one question? Just to make sure we're clear as staff, the, the five hundred twenty-three thousand six. Hundred and fifty-seven dollars for the new high school road improvements would come from ABSS capital reserves, and the commissioners had mentioned earlier that if there is reimbursement, the commissioners would want the funding from DOT to go back into the ABSS capital reserve. Is Correct. that your design? That's my understanding. Board, do we agree? Yes, I do. Right, we haven't well, we taken have a motion. Yet. We need I, to. I understand. Just want to make sure that's clear. Is that good? Would that be your recommendation? I would, I would, if there's reimbursement, I would recommend that it goes back into the school system's capital reserve and then they can use it on uh, other projects. And it gives them encouragement to make sure we get those funds in. It's kind of like lottery money. When you still apply for it, big incentive to try to bring projects in less than budget. Yes, sir. We have a motion on the floor. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. All opposed? Me. I think we need to move. Move forward. Okay, 4 1. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We've had a request for a 10 minute recess.
We'll be in recess for 10 minutes. Call the meeting back in order. Okay. Our health director, thank you, sir. All right, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioners. Um, this week is National Volunteer Week, so I definitely want to do a shout out to all our volunteers that um, have helped throughout this COVID effort, have helped throughout the with the vaccination site, continue to help with the vaccination site. Um, I especially want to give big thanks to really all the staff and of course the volunteers for the wonderful customer service that they do. Um, either uh, taking appointments every day or at the Eric Lane site with this vaccination effort. So big kudos to them on their customer service ability and our partners Cone as well. Very good customer service over at that site. Um, so really not much from previous weeks here. We have stayed pretty consistent with this plateau since uh, February 21st. Um, we're still seeing about 34 cases come in each day um, of positive COVID-19. Um, so not too much from the last time I reported two weeks ago. We're pretty much at that flat line. Um, percent positives, uh, we're still at 5%. 5.1% was the last one. Uh, if you really average it out from the 20 to 21st, it's right at, right at 5% since those last couple weeks. So not too much of a, a change there. Same thing with new, uh, new cases per 100,000, um, 252 new cases per 100,000 over 14 days. That's dipped a little bit. Uh, again, when we average this out since uh, February 21st, it's right around 280 cases. So that stayed pretty consistent, few waves here and there, but mostly the same. Our COVID deaths, since I reported to you uh, two weeks ago, um, we haven't had any deaths over the two weeks with, with the caveat we it's did wonderful. have eight additional deaths that were delayed in reporting. Um, so again, assuming hopefully we haven't had any delayed reports over the two weeks, but we had that were from January and February um, that got to us late. So we had to, of course, incorporate them in, in the numbers. But over the last two weeks, we haven't seen any pop up on this. How does a delayed death happen? <laughs> I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, we get the paperwork, we look at the date, and then we start the investigation, and we turn it around a quick, put okay. it in the computer, and it goes to the state. No, words, are not required to wait and die. <laughs> I mean, because I saw some COVID deaths in the um, bitch death certificates now, and that's news, and yeah. so that must be the ones you're talking about. Likely so. I don't know. Okay. I didn't, yeah. Okay. I apologize, that was a bad joke. <laughs> Bruce, I don't know if that's advancing there. Nope. Good. There we go. Um, I just wanted to point out here, so um, this is especially telling of how well um, the vaccine is doing, especially when we're looking at our 65 and older population. Back in January, 18% um, of the cases were 65 and older. In the month of February, 10% were 65 and older. And currently, over the last three weeks, 6% were 65 and older. So I expect these numbers to continue to go down. I mean, if you look back um, just at the end of March, really, um, we started really vaccinating everybody. So anybody from 16 all the way up until um, 64 in that age group. So hopefully our cases will continue and that vaccine kicks in and people start building up community to do that. Of the case of the new case counts, and from a historical perspective, are we taking a look at any numbers for like elementary age children, middle school age children, high school age children, are we seeing any numbers in there that would indicate that children are transmitting the disease or carrying the disease in so, at any time? Yeah, so looking at looking at uh, January is about 12% 12, 12 of our cases. February was 12% of our cases. And this last three weeks been about 15% of our cases. So a little bit notching up um, of that age group. So we'll continue to monitor and see how that occurs if that continues to increase or stay, decrease, stay the same or decrease. So there's about three points fluctuation from anywhere from zero all the way up to um, 64 years of age. So there's a little fluctuation plus and minus for those age group. But the most significant difference has been in that 65 and only the category. In the 18 and under age group, we've, we haven't had any deaths, I don't believe, in the county. Am I correct? From um, COVID? So zero to 19, we've had zero, zero deaths. Zero. As 
far as our outbreaks and clusters in nursing homes, we have three nursing homes in outbreak. That is down from one from the last time I reported. Residential care facilities, we have zero. That is down from three the last time I reported to you. Congregate living is zero. Correctional, one. Our clusters, child care is zero, and that's down from two last time I reported, and one K through 12 school. Our vaccination effort, so in Alamance County, or those with Alamance County residents, 54,837 have been partially vaccinated, which is 32.4% of the total population. When we just look at our vaccination population, those 16 and older, it's right up there, 44 to 45% um, have been partially vaccinated. People fully, fully vaccinated, 41,876, or 24.7% of the total vaccination. Uh, the health department has uh, received 25,475 first dose of vaccine, and we've administered 24,398 first doses of vaccine. Uh, for second doses, we received 22,355, and we've administered 19,976. For Johnson & Johnson, we received 100 doses, um, and we were able to do 101 doses at the uh, detention center before they paused the Johnson & Johnson, and I'll talk more about that here in a second. When we look at race and ethnicity, um, not much has changed since I last reported to you. We were able to bring up those Hispanic numbers from 3.3% to 10.8%, not just the health department, community, community at large, all the partners. On April 10th, our uh, medical director, Dr. Newton, um, did a Facebook Live with the Hispanic Liaison Group, and they had over 720 views of that presentation. It was done all in Spanish, so um, quite was well attended. Alrighty, so a um, little update of where we're at and where we're going. Um, the Johnson & Johnson, as you may have heard, is, is on pause. Um, they had about 6 million vaccines. There are six cases of what they call uh, cerebral vascular sinus thrombosis. Um, these are rare occurrences coupled with low platelet counts. Uh, the CDC and the FDA decided to pause this because they're very rare conditions. Um, to study the vaccine further, and that group with the CDC and the FDA will meet on April 23rd uh, to hopefully render a decision either to continue or move on for further, further research. Pfizer has completed its study for children 12 to 15. They have submitted that data. Uh, so the CDC and the FDA should be meeting here in the future to discuss if they will approve it for 12 to 15 year olds. We may see uh, in May, possibly, possibly as early as May, or June um, if they approve it uh, to do that population from 12 to 15 years of age. Tony, can I just ask a question? Yes. Pfizer, were there any kind of side effects except feeling bad? Or uh, My mother, I think, had that, and she's got terrible arthritis. Man, her joints hurt her after that second shot. But that's good because she's got it and she's okay. But has there been side effects that have been talked about because I know if you're watching TV and a commercial comes on and it's about they got a theme song and it's a medication and then this guy that you don't know who he is talks 300 miles an hour to talk about all the side effects like if you see this run I mean it's unbelievable all the things because that means something like that happened they have to be recorded has Pfizer had side effects like Johnson Johnson six and how many million how many yeah, did you say? six million so okay. one million okay yeah. okay yeah. okay so is it just that, or is it, as Pfizer had some things, there's yeah. no perfect, everybody's wired different. I can't take anything, I'm allergic to everything. I mean, seriously allergic to everything, but that's my body makeup. So what's the deal with like six, and then what's the outcomes of Pfizer on people? Yeah, so for the Johnson & Johnson piece, the, 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 the cerebral vascular sinus mm -hmm. thrombosis is a very, very yeah. rare event. Um, and it's coupled with a low platelet count. So this was standing out to scientists to say, hey, we better pause it real quick because it is so rare. I mean, granted, one in a million is a, you know. Yeah, still, you know, that's you're, one. You're, <laughs> you know, it's, it's likely not to happen to you. Um, so that's the reason why they pause it. There's a reporting entity. Um, so any, any effects, any side effects, um, we have to report it as a provider. Um, to, to that re entity as well as any other medical provider does. And that's how it was flagged for the Johnson & Johnson piece, right? So this is ongoing. As far as the Pfizer vaccine, I mean, of course, you're aware that the side effects anywhere, sore arm, mm -hmm. malaise, low-grade fever, those are the common ones. And of course, ones that we really screen, screen for is a severe allergic reaction. These are typically folks that have had 
allergic reactions right. in the past, right? And that's what we're really trying to avoid. But any other conditions haven't been flagged as of yet, to the best of my Moderna, knowledge. Moderna, any of that? Moderna, the same thing, yeah, okay. to the best of my knowledge. So, but I, but I, I think it's safe to say that if those do occur because of the reporting that something occurs, that that they will pause it just just as they did okay. the Johnson and Johnson. Thank you. Uh, appointments. So uh, we continue to take appointments online and in the call center. Two weeks ago, um, we started not being able to fill every appointment. Um, was it, there's about 60 missing appointments, 40 to 60. Last week was the first week we haven't been able to fill at least half of the appointments. So this isn't just common to us. Um, it's occurring with all the other providers in the county, all the other providers in the state, and all the providers in the nation. We've hit that crossover point that there's more supply and there's more providers in the marketplace. So that's a good thing. Um, which kind of brings me, and we do we do walk-ups. I should have added the airplane, so it's just not appointments. Cohen does walk-ups as well. We get about 16 to 20, at least at the health department-wise, uh, walk-ups that come into the facility. But I do want to direct your attention to a poll that came out from Elon University about three weeks ago. They surveyed online um, North Carolinians. Um, <clears throat> They, in their survey, participates 38% of the participants reported um, that they had already had received the vaccine. So this is consistent with what the state um, at that time was around 30% partially vaccinated. It's very consistent there. 25% reported that they do plan to take the vaccine. So you know that's good news. So I encourage you, if you do plan on taking the vaccine and you haven't made your appointment, come on down and we'll get you vaccinated or any other provider out there as well. And then 18% uh, were, were on the fence. They weren't sure they were gonna get their vaccine. So my advice is talk with your medical provider and make the best decision that, that you can for you. And hopefully folks will talk and have a serious conversation with their medical provider on what's the right decision for them to get their vaccine. Okay, um, Eric Lane. So I know this is next on the agenda, but I, I'm kind of give you the, the future piece of it, of Eric Lane. Um, I know we'll be asking next to extend the contract uh, for one more month uh, up until May 31st. Um, what we're looking to do is demobilize um, by May 31st at Eric Lane. This will allow us to get through the big wave of second dose shots as well as continue to bring in first dose shots. Uh, demobilize and take the, the vaccination effort back to the Human Services comp, um, Campus. We estimate that we'll be able to run about 200 folks on campus, uh, the Human Services Campus, uh, each day, as well as take the show on the road and go mobile with the vaccination effort. Truly seek out those spots in the county um, that have yet to be served or need to be served, and we will work with our cone partners since they also have a mobile effort to tackle that together um, and make sure everybody in the county is served for, for vaccines. So that's kind of our plan moving forward um, uh, with, with the vaccination effort. Question real quick, have you seen any benefit in reaching segments of the community that were having a difficult problem or having a problem with before from the billboard that uh, the Coxes over at Cox Toyota have offered to us? Yeah, I, I have seen no, no benefit or anybody that has come in and seen, you know, say, hey, we saw the billboard, but I hope that is occurring. Um, you know, it is, it is, it's a wide cast net of advertising out there, so. Go ahead and let's, let's get into item uh, eight number four, oh. eight four, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. The addendum. So the next item before you is um, to do one more month over at Eric Lane. Um, that and that cost uh, is $23,958.33. Um, the lease and the utilities associated with it are being paid by FEMA funds. So again, as I mentioned, this will allow us to do that. Last big wave of second doses coming through um, as well as demobilize uh, the Eric Lane and move it over to the Human Services Campus by June 1. If somebody gets their late in the month, their first one, and they're due for their second one past this, do you guys recommend them a site or or what? Like Walgreens or whatever, Southcourt Drug. Do so you for send their, for the their second, second dose? Mm -hmm. we, so when they come in for their first dose, so let's say we're at Eric Lane in June, or excuse me, May, May 15th, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they're due for their second dose, June 10th. Um, they will leave it with an appointment that says, report to 319 Graham, Hopedale Road, okay. Human Service Campus. Okay. They'll Great. know where to go. No questions, they'll know. Yeah, it'll okay. be very clear. Great. Motion to approve the request. Second. 
Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tony. Okay, the planning board. Is she on? I believe yeah, uh, Tony's joining us by Zoom. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. I should be on a board somewhere. I think I see me over there. Um, tonight you have on your agenda planning board membership applications and a recommendation from your planning board. What you have there are multiple candidates that submitted to planning board for an opportunity last fall. Uh, let's see here at the well submitted and talked about in December, but actually reviewed and recommended in January this year. Planning board heard applicants for what at that time were two positions on the board. For those two positions, you, you have a list of everybody that was um, put in applications. Um, just a quick note, there's only a few that, as planning board does their process, they will hear this at their meetings. They also invite the applicants to speak with them. And this was done by Zoom. Um, and every applicant was sent an, an invite for the Zoom. But the ones that decided to participate were Rodney Chi, Barrett Brown, Selling, Sandy Ellington Graves, Tim Woody, and Philip Cobb. Those actually, those guys spoke with the board that night. Uh, that board is very much so set of precedents that showing up to their meeting via by Zoom or in person is something that they've done for many years and that by itself will sometimes pull you out of recommendation from planning board to be a member because they'd like to speak to these applicants in person and feel like they really need to speak to them by person and that way they can make a recommendation that they feel comfortable with. So with that being said, uh, we also had, what was it, three people that removed their name from the list for the planning board to consider at their meeting. So Charles Deaton, Willie Holiday, and Charles Sidnor had asked to not be considered by planning board at that time. The other three, Ernest Bear, Cora Palf Palfi, and Tamara Kersey, uh, did not attend. So the planning board is not accustomed to entertaining applications with no attendance after invitation. So it came down to the five people that I spoke to you about that they actually did get to speak to. Uh, again, at that time, there were only two vacancies. Today, at our last planning board meeting in February, we did have a resignation by Ms. Cheek. So currently we have three board or board positions open. The board did not entertain any applications at their February meeting. Uh, they wanted to see what commissioners wanted to do with the other two seats and then kind of open up and entertain what to do with that third seat and run back through applicants probably at their next meeting or when we get enough applicants to discuss. So the planning board's recommendation at their January meeting for the two seats were Mr. Rodney Cheek and Mr. Philip Cobb. And that's a recommendation to you all to fill two of the three seats um, with those two members. That was pretty lengthy discussion by planning board. Uh, that was something that planning board uh, unanimously, unanimously voted on. Uh, there was no split vote on that. Tonight, from uh, planning director's perspective, we do have those three seats open. That is a 13 member board. Each member um, can represent a township. We have that many townships and we can have three people from the town, same township representing the planning board, but no more than three. So once we cap it three, we can't entertain applicants from those townships. Uh, from a planning perspective, we have our unified development ordinance and a lot of other activity coming up pretty quick on the main agenda for the board. Uh, with Ms. Chief resigning, I would recommend um, if the board can entertain uh, taking on Mr. Chief as a new member. He's been a planning board member for a long time. He did have to resign uh, or he, his term expired and gave up his seat and that is required to be done for a year before you can reapply to the planning board. So he, I guess December of this last year, 2020 would have been his year. So he is reapplying to get back on the board. Like I said, he's been on there for many years. Um, are we gonna 
vote on these separately? It depends on oh. uh, a number of things. Any other questions by this board to Ms. Cowell? I have one, but it's, it's not this. It's something else. Right. But it's not this. Okay, but it's what she does. Yeah. All right. I'm the ex officio member of that board. Um, in light of the fact that particularly um, Miss Cheek has resigned, mm -hmm. and uh, Miss Thompson, your objection was having family members, right. multiple family members on the board, um, I would recommend that at this point Rodney Cheek be approved by this board because there's no longer that conflict. Right. Um, would this board like to entertain these one at a time or my other recommendation would be, and this is not a motion yet, um, that possibly the other two uh, members, we let it go back to the planning board and see, because I understand they have additional applications and be able to um, look at the additional applications. Uh, they could still receive additional applications. So any of you folks out there that are listening and, and watching this meeting, uh, you still have time to get your application in for this board. Um, but my thought would be approve Rodney Cheek at this point and defer the other two openings to our next meeting, which would give the planning board an opportunity to, to review those and make a second recommendation. Am I correct, Mr. Chair, that we have a recommendation from the planning board to approve three? No, my understanding is we have a, a and correct me, um, if, you, if I'm wrong, my understanding is we have a recommendation that uh, Philip Cobb and Rodney Cheek be approved by the planning board. Um, there has not been a third uh, because the resignation took place at the last planning board meeting. Right. That's correct. Yes, the Joshua Consona, I don't know that I'm saying that right, uh, is on your agenda. He is a new applicant. Uh, Planning Board has not had a chance to entertain his application. That has been brought to you in advance of them, but he is on the list for tonight. And are we are we discussing? Are we in a discussion thing right now? We are. Um, we've got the other young man. Is um, I know him as Blake Cobb. I've known Ray, his father, and Blake since he was a little squirt. These are some of the finest people you'll ever meet in your life, and I mean that sincerely. Um, but me personally i i don't vote for family members on the same vote we do that in church <laughs> and i do that here and I, ray and blake are father and son and they're both qualified but the fact that they are father and son i have a conflict with that and it is like i said they are salt of the earth people they really are so that's that's the only reason i would not vote for, for blake and i hate that but that's just my convictions but they are, I understand, in different precincts as well. The yes. father and son. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll make a motion that we approve Rodney Cheek and defer the other two openings to allow the planning board to come back to us. And I would request, not as part of the motion, but request that the planning board bring in people to the planning board meeting to allow them to make a second presentation or a first presentation for new members. But that's not part of the motion. That's simply a request from the planning board. Do I have a second? Second. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Billy. Go ahead. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, accept the unanimous the decision of the planning board on these two. So I will not be voting for that. Um, and then the planning board could, in my view, elect the next member at their next meeting. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion to approve Rodney Cheek and defer the other two openings to a uh, later meeting signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. 4-1. Okay, I think um, we have one other question. Yes, I've got a question. It's about trash. Um, we have been working with a, a, a yard in Burlington that's just, well, it's a miniature landfill. I'll call it that. <laughs> and um, 
I get out in the community and ride around. I try to go to all kinds of places and 87 North and 87 South are working on their versions of some of these same things. And I'm just curious when folks call us and ask, you know, I've got all this stuff in the yard beside me and we ask for them to kind of pick up for themselves and it's just really something to deal with. Who deals with this and are we enforcing ordinances that we have or what are we doing? So is that a question for me? It is because you are the <laughs> queen of this and I don't know. <laughs> What you're talking about actually is fully encompassing of multiple departments. The specific one you're talking about over in Burlington is actually in their ETJ. So that complicates things. In ETJs, Burlington is allowed to do their building inspections, do planning and development, but they don't do their own nuisance. State law doesn't allow them to. So we have to do nuisance abatement. That specific uh, property that you're speaking of, and all uh, there was what we call white trash is the appliances and things there's appliances over there there's trash over there seems that there's no septic system for the um, home over there so we've involved planning got involved because of some vehicles over there we do junk cars um, environmental health does what we have as a solid waste ordinance and that's where that white trash the appliances regular trash they get involved with that and then after we had very little success, almost no success there, legal did step in and Clyde arranged to where we could take care of that situation and use some of our own resources to help clean that up. And I think it's still in progress um, with dumpsters and Terry Johnson was involved in helping us with getting some inmates to help clean that situation up. City of Burlington was involved, I believe, in some of the equipment to help get it cleaned up. That is a massive effort on multiple fronts to try to clean that space up. Well, let me just interrupt you for a second, Tanya, because I've been over there a lot, took pictures, met their neighbors, and it, it's hoarding is a disease. It is out of control. There's TV shows, reality about it, and it's absolutely pitiful. It is it's when a family's in true crisis, and I understand that. I'm talking about out in the community whenever all the cars I've ever had in my life are parked in my backyard. They don't work anymore. And all the, say, other kind of things I work on, and they're not working, and the grass has grown up around them too. I mean, I'm talking about stuff like this. I have, um, I'm a picture taker, because I will tell on you, and, and I've seen this, and it's not safe. It's snake mess, it's rat mess, it's all kind of stuff. And uh, I had the mom tell me on this particular street you're talking, her kids couldn't play in the yard because the rats were invading her yard. That's absolutely, that is disease.com waiting to happen. But also out in our county, I see these, these same situations. And it's like, we wanna say we've got a litter problem. We do have a litter problem because we don't, we don't push it enough we get to where we're doing really well we find people we got the signs all that and then everybody we do right then all of a sudden we start doing it again we are creatures of habit this is beyond litter and i mean i'm so proud that like the sheriff has got his group they're going out we've gotten emails people thanking us seeing the difference just a difference in a road because we have got to stop trashing our earth we only live on one but i'm talking about yards where people have been spoken to their, about their neighbors can you guys we'll be glad to help you clean this up we don't mind and it's just no what do we do do we have rules on our books that we're supposed to follow and we're so overwhelmed we're not following or what because if we've got these things that say you're not supposed to have this and we don't reinforce this then that's on us so i'm just curious what can we do they're right when you're talking junk vehicles you're mm -hmm. allowed to have three junk vehicles with covers on them in the rear of your yard by our ordinance when you're talking trash that's under our solid waste ordinance and that is handled through environmental health all of us have as you all know we're working on the udo to kind of solidify we all have a little bit different enforcement process unfortunately we do go out we are complaint driven so we get a complaint from anyone in the community and we take them online and people call either way we go out and take pictures check out the problem and we work hand in hand with environmental health to try to 
assess because most situations don't just have one department we have trash and we have junk vehicles likely on the same piece of property we might even have an abandoned mobile home that we get to deal with too so all of that tends to come together so we work hand in hand and we do serve the letters and notices that we're allowed to serve and then we get to a point like the one we have in Burlington DTJ where we're just not getting anywhere that's when we hand it over to legal and find out what kind of legal ramifications we have to try to clean up the situation. Well, do we need our own trash legal department? <laughs> well, I've been oh called goodness. lots of things, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a new one. Um, but I, I will say this, it, it just took a few <laughs> phone calls to Glen Raven Mills, mm -hmm. City of Burlington, Richard Hill at the landfill, uh, the Sheriff's Office, and uh, meeting with the daughter, Mrs. Caps, as you know, who takes care of her mother. And she, um, in con as a consideration for dismissing the criminal solid waste violation charge, allowed us to go on the property and have the inmates out there to bring all of the white goods up to within range of the Burlington knuckle boom truck that loaded it up. And uh, Levin Recycling was assisting us and. Richard took a landfills dumpster for the waste and the trash, and the inmates worked really hard. A shining example of how we can work. And our health director over there declared it <laughs> an imminent hazard, and that was the key. Uh, it's a health hazard, as you know. It's a hot mess. It is a very serious health hazard. The uh, environmental health specialist put Ms. Caps in touch with a low interest loan program so she can get a septic system put in but before we can put it in we had to clean the place up and it was a big 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 job and everybody here without hesitation agreed to help well One stuff like off. that just gets away from you and you can't do it yourself well the and the kicker is there is another remedy that imminent uh, that abatement had, uh, order is still out there. It's like a big shark. And uh, if people start dragging things back, we'll go to court and get a temporary restraining order, ordering the people to stop. Well, how can we come across that we really mean business I think that throughout says our whole it, county? I think that says it right there. Now that the sheriff has the s trash squad, if we have a legal trash department, <laughs> uh, <laughs> We did this once before. The sheriff, one of the first things he and I did was the Adam Lamb property. Need a new insignia for some people, right, Sheriff? Do I? A new insignia for some people? Yeah. But see, no. if you live beside something like that, and it don't have to be that massive. Oh, I understand. But it is. It, it's, it's a really, it depreciates your property. If you ever try and sell your home, it's not safe. I yes. mean, we just all need to be responsible. And it, I'm it not has, preaching to anybody. Who it has to say. rise to the magnitude of a nuisance. You know, the rats, the grass. Um, I understand a car breaking down yeah. and somebody having to fix it. But when that happens multiple times and you've got a junkyard, we have an ordinance that prohibits that. It's just a matter of having the people available to enforce it. And right now, our planning director is also our building inspector. Uh, mm -hmm. So she's pulling double duty, and we're all doing the best we can. Well, I know it's that. It's safe. overwhelming. Every way you look at it, it's overwhelming. Mr. Wilson, just... let me ask this question of Mr. Haygood. Um, the sheriff has talked about trash on the streets. We all, all the five commissioners have talked about trash on properties and, and whatever else. Can we set up some kind of group? Name it whatever you like. You know, a lot of the cities that I visit on a regular basis with the balloon rallies and whatever, they have streets that are sponsored by an industry or by a group or of, of all kinds of type things. Why can we not do that here and find funding for signs about littering work with the sheriff's department, work with the health department, the, and all of these different departments, uh, and have this work for a cleanup. We could even have a sponsored, uh, you know, a contest to have uh, people report, you know, whatever, and whoever sees the most um, problems that are valid, maybe wins a, a 
free McDonald's hamburger or whatever, <laughs> whatever it could be. Um, and I'm sure some of the industry might sponsor such a contest, um, but it could help clean up our entire county and help all these different departments that are fighting on a daily basis to keep our county responsible, clean, and beautiful. Ms. Thompson, would you support such a, a movement? Yeah, but it's going to, have to be more than a cheeseburger, John. I well, I, I'm hoping that. I, 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 mean. I was going to say a Happy Meal, but <laughs> but I suspect LabCorp or Glen Raven or some of our corporate yeah, sponsors might uh, sponsor some kind of contest. Well, I think it's great. I just I just know we've got such a great county. I want the whole county to look like Cedar Rock Park. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I just, my daughter's an environmental science major and she checks my trash can for plastic to make sure I'm recycling. She's like a monitor. And we just have to take care of our world. If we, own, we don't have another one, we can just throw this one away and start all over. So. Mr. Haygood, could you uh, talk to different departments and Certainly. report back to us at our May 3rd meeting? Certainly. And Thank you, sir. <laughs> I'm fairly confident, too, that we can get some corporate oh, sponsors. So, uh, yeah. What about the university? Some of our, some oh, of restaurants. our restaurants Sorry, locally would be probably willing to help. Attorneys, Civitans. The John Paisley Law Firm to uh, adopt the highways. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the Morales Good job, Thomas. No, that kind of comment, that kind of comment, I'm going to have to order you out of Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. 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 Didn't realize you were in for the evening, did you? <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm on later, too, so I'll be here for a while. Uh, my name is Skye Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I'm the director of the Family Justice Center here in Alamance County, um, and I'm here to present to you all today about creating a domestic violence fatality review team for Alamance County. So there are roughly 200 teams in 44 states nationwide. Uh, North Carolina has established teams in Mecklenburg, Wake County, Pitt County, and Buncombe County. Um, the teams review between two and four fatality cases per year and then would have two days, administrative days, to create recommendations on policy changes, system level changes, uh, locally, statewide, and nationally. The domestic violence fatality review team would identify and analyze homicide cases, suicides, and other deaths caused by or related to or somehow trackable to domestic violence. Reviews can be formal or informal. I would recommend for our county to go more of a formal approach with a facilitator. Um, teams devise, as I said, the, the recommendations and the strategies for changes. Uh, the goal is to prevent homicide in the future. So the philosophy behind these review teams, it is not to blame any one agency, any one department. Um, it's not to investigate and to figure out who did wrong and led to this death. The point of these teams is to come together. There is a balance of some accountability if there are policies that could have been put in place, programs that could have been put in place to prevent the homicide. However, it's to learn lessons from the homicide, really review that case. Um, we want to create a culture of safe reviewings, as I said, building that trust and we're not putting anyone on trial. We're not looking at who's at fault. We're, we're looking at how to move forward. Um, we want this team to work as a team of experts, not individual experts, but really bringing that expertise together. And we need perspective of victims. So um, evidence based practice for our domestic violence fatality review teams means interviewing surviving family members, friends, neighbors and coworkers. So there is precedence in the law for creating domestic violence fatality review teams. The first one was session law 2009-52, which created, um, which allowed for the creation of fatality review teams in North Carolina. Uh, the second one is 2013-70, and this reauthorized a team for Mecklenburg, but specifically created teams in Alamance and Pitt County. It requires every team to issue a report to the Domestic Violence Commission, the Governor's Crime Commission, and your local county commissioners. Um, it says every three years, though the teams I've been talking to, they really do this more on an annual basis, but that formal report has to be submitted every three years. And it establishes team structure. So there, there are two pages of who has to be on this team. It's a pretty big team. Uh, first is a representative from your domestic violence agency, which would be Family Abuse Services in our county. Um, next would be two survivors of domestic violence to be appointed by the lead agency. 
district attorney or appointed um, designee, local law enforcement officer appointed by the largest municipality, which would be, or largest police department, which would be uh, Burlington PD, sheriff or um, designee, a lot of these will say or designee, medical examiner, director of the Department of Social Services, director of the health department, uh, director of your local managed care organization, superintendent of public schools or designee, um, representative from each primary health care system, a magistrate designated by the chief district court judge, representative from an institution of higher education if there's one in your county, and we do have Elon University here, um, and that would be a special appointment by the county commissioners. Probation parole officer, district court judge, and then the county commissioners can appoint up to two additional representatives on the board who have a certain expertise in domestic violence. And there are some rights that are afforded to this team um, through the laws that I mentioned below or before. So the first one is that it makes all of the records accessible. So this team has the right to ask for any records, medical, social services, mental health, um, medical examiner's report, anything from the district attorney's office or from the investigation. The goal is to really plot out the victim's life and all the events that led up to the homicide. So all of the information is just, um, requestable by this team. Second is that there is confidentiality immunity. So nobody on this team can be subpoenaed to testify about the uh, details in the case. Um, it's just a really long way of saying we can't be subpoenaed for it. <laughs> I'm not an attorney, so I'm not gonna pretend to be one. So getting started, the first step was presenting um, the want of having a domestic violence fatality review team to the Justice Advisory Council, which uh, Chairman Paisley sits on. And that was done in January, and Justice Advisory Council approved moving forward with establishing a domestic violence fatality review team. Um, next, the county commissioners need to designate a lead agency responsible for convening the team, gathering information. I do wanna be clear when I say lead agency, it does not mean this agency is in charge, it's really the, the person who's gonna coordinate everything. Once a team is established, there's a leadership structure, they would elect co-chairs and folks who would represent the board. We would need to gather homicide data for Alamance County. So as I've ventured into this, I have figured out there are multiple homicide lists, but not one comprehensive list. So law enforcement agencies keep their own, district attorney's office keeps one on cases they're prosecuting. Um, but so far we can't find a centralized location for this data. Wanna identify who from the, the long list of who needs to be appointed, who is actually gonna serve on this team, and then if there's gonna be any alternates for those agencies. Uh, de develop protocols so this team will need to establish how do we gather documents how do we um, send out meeting notices generate reports we would also need confidentiality agreements for all the individuals and agencies associated we would need to as I said create a leadership structure those would be um, probably co-chair positions and those would be folks who would advocate for political change based on what comes out of the review team we would look into case selection, no pending cases, so they would have to have the seal of approval by the district attorney's office. Identify a facilitator for a team, so there is one person in the state that comes highly recommended and then looking for funding to pay for the facilitator. A facilitator can cost up to about 7,200 a year. My hope is that the grant that we hold with the um, Governor's Crime Commission for the Family Justice Center could absorb that cost and it wouldn't be any additional cost. So today's ask, I ask for y'all to vote to create a domestic violence fatality review team. Our county does have a child fatality review team, so we would work hand in hand in what, what they do. So the precedent is there um, to go ahead and create this team. Next, we would need to appoint uh, a lead agency. The recommendation from the Justice Advisory Council is for the Family Justice Center to take on all of that legwork and the, the coordinating of that team. And third, I would ask for um, the Family Justice Center director is not explicitly stated in the list of um, representatives on that team so number 16 the two members that could be appointed by the county commissioners I would ask for one of those to be my position the Family Justice Center director to bring those uh, expertise and um, the, the expertise on domestic violence to that team what questions do you have I just have a statement working domestic violence for years and serving on the domestic violence commission for six years um, last year, since all the numbers aren't in for 2021, there were 61 murders in North Carolina. And the first nine on the list were murder-suicides. That seems to be really popular now, even with the children. 
um, we had in um, February 5th of last year, well, yeah, we had a murder in Elon here. And also um, March the 5th in Chatham County, we had, they had a murder of five. It was the husband and he took out four other family members. So domestic violence is deadly. It is also deadly for law enforcement that answer that call. It is their worst nightmare. They never go alone because you never know what to expect. It's like an emotional, chaotic night or day. And so um, whatever we can do to make this disease better, we need to support it because it, it lays on the backs of children and they go to school and it takes away their studies and their fun and they're just living free because they watch that clock because they know as soon as that last bell rings what they're going home to. And um, I, I've been worried sick about young people out of school for so long locked in a house with their abuser and um, I hope they all just scream as loud as they can and let that be known to the guidance counselors because that's a important role of the school system. They are the eyes and ears for children. So. Um, Whatever you need, Sky, I'm behind you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept Ms. Sullivan's recommendation for the domestic violence fatality review team with the three recommendations she mentioned in her presentation. I'd, I'd, like, to, motion. I'd like to recommend one additional uh, modification. That is, the county commissioners still be allowed to appoint two members, right. but also have the director uh, as a, an additional member that she did not just add one more member to the team. Do we know if the statute allows for that? That's a good question, does it? I honestly can't answer that question. What Mr. I Virginia. what I put on here was oh, the the makeup of the board or of the commission based on what's in the statute. So I don't know if there's anywhere further along. I'm not going to interpret law for y'all where if it allows for that. Just all right. Any opinion? You're just asking to establish the. Uh, review team and appoint the Justice Center as the lead for the team yes. tonight. Yes, and possibly make myself one of the additional. So I wasn't clear on if I can be the lead <coughs> agency and not be appointed to the team. So that's where the third ask came from about adding myself as well, one of the two recommended. Yeah, well, you're, you work for the Family Justice Center, right? You are the the director, the director, yes, director. but so the Family Justice Center isn't explicitly listed as one of the members. I don't think that would be a conflict for you to be on the team, but I don't think the statute prohibits that. It just says the county has the authority to appoint the members of the team. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Albright, are you suggesting we add that as an addition? I think that's a, appropriate. All right. that in there. Would I think, you I'd accept your... that amendment, yes, Mr. Would you? And I will, yes. All right. We have a motion, second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did I understand there was another appointment to be made? There, there we, will be one other appointment to be made. Um, the hope is that the team would get together and we would have a recommendation to bring forth to y'all. Um, and then the other appointment comes from somebody from the higher education. So someone from Elon University and the team can either convene and try to identify someone and bring that forth or if you have someone to recommend, we could take that recommendation. Well, would that be Elon or ACC or either or? Actually, it just says, let's see. It says a representative from an institution of higher education. So it doesn't Shouldn't say all. Either. So it could be either, that is correct. Do we have a preference? I'd leave that open. <coughs> that I do not have any recommendations at this time. Is this something like you, they would apply for, like these other things they apply for, like the planning board? Is this something they would apply for, these two people? Somebody would express interest in it. Yeah, okay. She, she could get you a list of those. How you yeah. could have one from each. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. I'll work on bringing that back to y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Haygood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, I'm just going to spend just a little bit of time talking with you about the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, the commissioners are familiar with this. We've uh, heard a lot of talk in the press and in our community about what does this mean for Alamance County. Just to uh, kind of uh, recap what the uh, uh, 
plan is about to sign into law on March 11th and allocate $65.1 billion in direct aid to U.S. counties. Our county, uh, we're uh, allocated to receive $32.8 million in funding. And according to the act, uh, we're slated to receive 50% of those funds not later than 60 days after its enactment and then get the remaining 50% uh, of funding no earlier than 12 months after we receive the first payment. And we're doing a lot of work listening and sitting in on uh, meetings hosted by the National Association of Counties and the Association of County Commissioners uh, about this, this funding and this act. And we're being told that we should expect to see detailed guidance for how we can use the funds more towards the middle of May of this year. Two new developments uh, uh, that we've just recently been through. Uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury is the uh, department that's going to oversee these funds, and they have created a new office within their confines, the Office of Recovery Program. That is going to be the new U.S. Treasury office that's going to be working with counties and all the other folks that will receive these funds. And also, uh, we've been working to put together the information that Treasury has told us that we need to have to get our first payment. This has included just some very logistic information, uh, federal taxpayer ID, our DUNS number, but Treasury has come out with a list of what the county has to provide and that has been provided to them. In fact, um, we're joined this evening by Mimi Clemens. I don't know, uh, Bruce, if you could pull Mimi up. I think I saw her name. She's still with us on Zoom. Can you, can you flip back and forth between Mimi and the presentation, Bruce? I wanted to be sure and introduce everybody to Mimi. Uh, as we work on that. But Mimi is a budget analyst in our budget department and has done a great job helping us navigate the coronavirus relief funds that came through the state. You know, anytime you receive uh, uh, millions of dollars unexpected from the state with compliance responsibilities and you want to track its outcomes, you, you really just need to have someone doing that. And Mimi has been the person. So can you, can you hear me, Mimi? Oh, yes, I can hear you. We're glad to have you with you with us tonight. I didn't know if you wanted to speak to your experience quickly about uh, dealing with CRF. Just kind of a uh, how that process went. Were you, were you pleased with the with the results and how everything went? Uh, keeping up with the money. Yeah. Um, overall, it went well. Um, I dealt with um, eight municipalities. Um, getting kind of that organized, um, and then also with the county's CRF uh, funding, um, and I'm excited to work on ARPA. Um, and, and again, I served as the point person um, for, for the CARES money, and um, it's a pleasure meeting all of you. So Mimi did spend a lot of time working with our municipalities, also uh, mm -hmm. through CRF. So she'll be uh, a, a good fit for this ARPA. Uh, mm -hmm. ARPA funding. So can you advance me, Bruce? I think I've, I've stopped advancing. Okay. So, commissioners, you'll recall that uh, right now we have four very broad guidelines for how we can use these funds. And uh, I won't read them to you, but mitigating the public health emergency of COVID-19, uh, uh, replacing lost revenue, the only capital investments that have been specifically noted right now by Treasury and the Act is water, sewer, broadband infrastructure, and then uh, premium pay for essential workers. That's the very broad guidelines at this time. Um, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've, we've been attending NACO and Association of County Commissioners. Mimi attends all of these. I attend most of these myself. Uh, the, both of these two groups are working very hard to try to help uh, counties understand how this money can be used. In fact, in your agenda packet, I thought it was important to include for you and for the public to see too, NACO has put a list together of frequently asked questions about the current status of the plan. And then they also, uh, NACO sub submitted to Treasury a list of uh, questions that they got from their counties that they represent that they are hoping Treasury will take into consideration as they develop this uh, future guidance and the more detailed guidance for the use of these funds. I've added a couple here that are just some ideas of the, the suggestions that NACO has made to Treasury. Uh, capital, capital investment, that has been one of the biggest questions from county governments across the nation because these funds do expire in December of 24. Everyone wants to be really careful what we invest in to make sure we're not doing something we can't sustain and capital is a natural investment. A lot of questions about capital. Uh, a, 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 asking for specific details from Treasury about how to help impacted industries. 
lots of questions from counties around the country about the school funding, how it can be used for uh, capital and for program uses. And then there's a desire uh, from counties, uh, us and other ones around the country, to, to hope that Treasury will put together very clear reporting guidelines and expectations on the front end and avoid any of the, uh, and we, Mimi uh, can speak to this, I'm sure we went through this with CRF, the, the, the rules kind of changed and tightened as we went along, right? And that's, that's a little tough to deal with, but uh, so we're hoping that Treasury will listen to NACO and not do that. And uh, they're also asking for additional definitions and criteria for premium pay and eligible workers. And from what I've understood thus far, that's not limited to local government workers. That can be uh, folks that have worked in industry out in the, in the private sector that really uh, are, are currently and have been uh, key people in the um, COVID effort. So, um, so we've worked as staff. Uh, Andrea and Mimi have worked together to put together a, a preliminary strategy plan that you have in your, in your packet. Uh, and what I'm trying to uh, hopefully demonstrate to the commissioners and to the public is that we are, even though we don't have the guidance, we don't yet know exactly what we can do with it, we are trying to lay plans that I hope the commissioners will be able to use along with staff and our partners for how to spend these funds. Uh, the main tenets of this strategic information that you have uh, will be that it's going to be important to determine the allowable use of the money. That is one of the key pieces. And then to coordinate with other uh, ARP funded agencies in Alamance County, other folks will be getting these money, cities in particular. So uh, we've talked a little bit about how we would possibly coordinate with the cities. We want to work with the commissioners in particular once we get these approved rules to set priorities. What are the commissioners uh, interested in trying to accomplish with this money? And then Mimi will be working hard to make sure we um, spend the money in a compliant way, staying in touch with Treasury or this new Office of Recovery Program to make sure uh, we're spending the money properly. Mimi spent a lot of time with CRF on the phone with uh, the NC Pro office, which was the new uh, state level office that was created during CRF, trying to get pre-approval for these spending, making sure we weren't doing anything that was going to put us in a bind. And then one of the most important pieces of, of this spending will be to track outcomes. My hope will be that we'll be able to demonstrate to commissioners and to the public that we've used this money for the betterment of the community and we can demonstrate how that how that uh, actually happened and again Mimi will be a key a key part of that um, we have identified just very preliminary this is not a limited list for everybody that we would work with as we uh, plan and spend these funds but these seem to be some of the ones that in this early stage have come to the top uh, obviously the commissioners are a key piece uh, for how we'll spend our funding then the, the municipalities the school system and the community college Cone Hospital and the Chamber of Commerce uh, are folks that we've identified thus far that we suspect we will be working with as we, once we learn uh, how the money can be spent as we set priorities. So in, in the, very, the preliminary strategic plan for these funds that you have uh, in your packet, some of these things have been uh, completed. Uh, we've, we've determined these preliminary action steps that I'm covering with you now. We've identified our potential partners, not, not a limited list, it could be added to and we have assigned staff to, to start the process of staying on top of this funding criteria and uh, starting to gather information, particularly from county departments. Mimi will be doing that very soon. Um, she's going to be meeting with county department heads and talking about what are we seeing at the county level. Uh, so identifying uh, and planning for the possible use of non-county funding streams, that's $65 billion for county governments. There is a tremendous amount of money out there that is not coming to counties that we may set priorities, and the commissioners might, that we can tap other sources to and try to leverage our money with other funding that this act puts into place. Uh, and again, uh, just to stress, we want to ensure that we stay compliant with our spending and report outcomes to commissioners, to our community, as well as to, uh, to the treasury. So uh, th there's no action needed for this this evening. I just wanted to, one, uh, I don't know, Bruce, if you pull Mimi back up. Yeah. Name. I wanted to introduce you to Mimi. She was very, as I say, very key to our uh, CRF uh, funding roles. I think she will be key to this um, uh, ARPA funding uh, effort also. And to, show, and to let you know that we are working, even though we don't have the, the guidance that we really need, we are trying to put things in place that we will be ready once that comes out. So um, Mimi, I don't know if you have anything that you would uh, like to add as we're uh, wrapping up our, our plan presentation. Um, 
I, I guess the only thing I'd add is uh, hopefully with this, um, it'll be more dealing with the um, U.S. Treasury's office um, rather than the state. That's a bit more tailored. Um, so hopefully it'll be, um, I guess, it'll be a bit easier <laughs> to sum around. Where are you, Mimi? Are you in the basement locked up? Where are you? <laughs> you got a big job. Um, um, <laughs> maybe, um, maybe works here at this what, building. So uh, she's in this building. Yeah, she does work in this building. Okay. She's, she's not in this building. I don't now. know if she's in the witness protection program. I'm just in the apartment. Bless your heart. So, having tried to answer any questions, commissioners, this is all preliminary. So I just wanted to let you see it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hagan. Just a couple of questions, yes. if I may, Mr. Yes, sure. <clears throat> We talk about funding partners. Uh, I know that's not an all exclusive list, but I mean, the, probably the biggest philanthropic philanthropic organization in the county, I think, is Impact Alamance. Yes. Uh, so that's probably a great partner to work with, and the, probably the entity that knows the most about uh, <coughs> other organizations in the county doing good work is probably the United Way. Yes. So I think indeed. that may be something good too. Also, last time we talked about this, you <coughs> mentioned that you would support um, having sort of a, an ad hoc community group to come up with additional ideas. Is that still? A recommendation that you have? Yes, I think uh, when the last time we talked about this, we, I mentioned that to the commissioners because I know there's a desire from the commissioners to um, account for these funds, prop, spend them in ways that help the community. So, and I, at the time, it seemed to be a consensus, certainly for management with the board too, uh, that there would be uh, wisdom in having some representatives from the community to be a part of the discussion about how to set priorities and then uh, uh, assign the fund. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but was there not also a provision in the in the available or available to us in the funding to use some of this money for um, small business loans, similar to what we did in the last with some of the last money we got? I think that was uh, uh, part of the aid to impacted industries. Right. Uh, so yes, that that is. We hope that we'll get some good guidance from the feds about how to do that. I think uh, you know we well, I think we struggled a little bit with that with CRF. Uh, making sure that we could meet the state's NC pros requirements and we wound up uh, if I'm not mistaken I think we wound up using some county dollars that had been offset by CRF funding to actually do the small business loan program it worked it worked but uh, the the restrictions that NC pro put on the use of the CRF money made it a little more difficult so I think small business loans uh, I think we have some issues about being able to do grants directly to um, uh, private business but loans and we have that infrastructure set up now with uh, Self-Help Credit Union, the Alamance Foundation, those things are in place. So once we, we receive these funds and know that that is an acceptable use, I, I would tell the commissioners, I'm sure, it's been well received with CRF money by affected businesses in the community. A lot of small businesses that may not have been able to get loans else, elsewhere uh, took advantage of it. So. Well, I'm sure we're also um, really refresh that the Treasury Department's going to create a, sub, a, a department which will start probably still be functioning 50 years from now <laughs> um, and probably staffed as, at a size equivalent to the Energy Department which was created about 50 years ago okay. to eliminate our de dependency on foreign oil. So uh, the government gets a chance, they'll, they'll <laughs> put people to work and keep them there for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Just a question, like the money's coming later. I remember when Tony and his mother and father and every cousin and anybody else he knew was over there at SeaTech in line doing all these shots and we needed all this extra help. He was overstretched because he doesn't have just one job. And I'm not picking on you, Tony, <laughs> but I mean, that would have been a great time to have you know, the COVID ferry fly over Alamance County. I'm just saying, it's just interesting that now it comes and we've seen people close and it's, we just took such a massive hit and I just wonder if this money comes now, if it's, it's not gonna fix everybody. And I, I mean, I just know a lot of people have lost so big and- um, well, We've seen a lot of people go out of business in Alamance County. Yeah. Permanently yeah. out of business. It's sure. heartbreaking, but I mean, I remember Y'all, I'm not kidding. It's just crazy. Well, I think uh, I think Bruce can attest to that. Between the tens of thousands of telephone calls coming in, and uh, just, just it was quite overwhelming. So to hear now that uh, it's 
it's, it's reaching a point that's uh, that is saturated. That's excellent news, but uh, it sure is. We want to thank you and Jeremy Atkins, our tax administrator. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Do you mind if I take this off? Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're okay. Thank you so much. I, I just not adapted to, uh, to doing a lot of speaking with that on. And I would like to commend the board for their endurance. Uh, I watch the meetings downstairs, and I'm just a casual viewer. And after a while, my, my head starts to spin. So I know as board members, you're, you're digging into each of these issues. And uh, it's, it's very commendable. I couldn't do it. But you are doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're right there. Uh, I'm doing this part of it. This is the only part I have to know. The other stuff is, you know, tune in, tune out. Uh, so what I have today is uh, I want to go over a report from the Department of Revenue. Uh, every year they run a sales ratio report, and we've got the results back. As of Thursday, matter of fact, this was originally going to be a preliminary, uh, this is what's coming. Now it's uh, this is what's here. And so let's see where is the clicker here. All right. Is it this one? Try it now. Hey, there you go. And so uh, this is the sales ratio study. Now the Department of Revenue every year looks through the sales for past year and it compares the price that the home sold for or any property sold for to the tax valuation on that property. And as they do this, they're looking for a percentage. So if they came out at 100%, that means our tax value matches the sale price of the property. Uh, if they came out at, say, 120%, that would tell us that tax value is above market. If it's 80%, tax value is 20% below market. That's what they're looking at. And they're doing that to determine the level of market um, assessment. So at revaluation, we go through and we lock in on the market and we leave it there until the next revaluation. But the market changes all the time. I mean, it changes day to day. And so this is giving them a feel for how far out of step we are with the current market uh, between revaluation uh, cycles. So what has the market done since 2017? I think this is... Uh, kind of a foregone situation. A little lag on the click, there it is. Yeah. So, and I brought this slide last year. I liked it so good that I brought it back. Uh, this is from February 2020. I found it in the Herald Sun. It was originally from News and Observer. In its first revaluation since 2016, homes in Wake County increased 20% in value from four years ago. Commercial properties increased 33%. Now, Wake County is on a four-year revaluation cycle. So when they went from 2016 to 2020, they had a pretty strong pickup in the market. And last year, we talked about you know kind of seeing this trend uh, here and what that was doing for our ratios. Well, as we go along, this is from Zillow from December 2020. Home value growth breaks records as rent stabilized. I want to point out, home values posted both the largest monthly and quarterly increases in Zillow records dating back to 1996. Uh, that's, that's pretty strong. That, that's um, more than I would have anticipated. This is from the Mevin Enterprise, Burlington number two hottest real estate market in the United States. This was from February of this year. Burlington snagged the number two spot, median home listing price in Burlington. $286,800, average of 40 days on the market. So, now, I'm, I'm excited about this growth, but, but this, is, this has caused me some heartburn, too. Um, if you go to Zillow, you can lock in just Alamance County and run the median home sale price. And as comparison, if we go back to January 2017, and that's right after revaluation, the average home sale was 137. January of this year, 180. 31% right, increase. We also subscribe to a service called CoStar. They give us commercial data so we can look at apartments, look at industrial, whatever. We pulled up their Piedmont Triad for their improved properties and got the price per square foot. January 17, again right after reval, $60 a square foot. January of this year, $75 a square foot, so that's up 25%. Not as much as residential, but still pretty significant. Um, so, 
given that the market has moved and our values have stayed the same, what do you think the DOR told us? Now in 2017, right after reval, they reported back that we had a 99.66% rate. And it's pretty rare to actually hit 100%, usually just a little over, a little under, but it should be right around 100. By 2018, we were at 96.5. 2019 was 91.73. 2020, 86.77, and that's when we discussed this last year. And then in 2021, 81.06%. And really, what you have to consider is that they're always looking backwards. So if I'm thinking as of January 1st, well, there are no sales in that year on January 1st. The most recent sale was from December 31st. So when they run that ratio, they're looking at all of 2020. Well, the early part of 2020 is probably lower. The later part of 2020 is probably higher. So that 81% is probably summer of 2020. We are well into the 70s right now, if you compare real market to what we can put on it for tax assessments. So as a, as a comparison, if I've got 200000 on, on a property, it'll sell for 260 I can't put 260 on it. I have to stay with 200 because that's what it was at Reval until our next revaluation lets us catch up. Now, there's a um, kind of a trend if you look back through some of our historical ratios. I don't have our 1977 cycle, that was the first one under the current law, but I do have 1985 forward, and I laid it out from year one right after reval to year eight right before reval. I did want to point out in 1985, we're, we're missing a year, uh, I think we had a missed filing, I think the 85 got put in the 86 folder and then the 86 went away, so I do have a missing year, uh, but it, I, I can't get a hold of that record. 2009 is something I want to point out as well. This was an unusual situation, very fluky, in that the market was performing well, and just as we locked in, it was crashing. And so we spent the entire cycle uh, above market value. You, you'd see sales, you know, five, ten percent under us all the time, completely common. That doesn't happen much. And so if we leave everything in, then if I compare year five, our average historically is 87% of market and we're at 81. A strong growth. But this is what surprised me, is if I pull the, the fluke cycle out where we're upside down, because that is unusual, look what happens. We're actually exactly normal for Alamance County. All right? In 85, we were already down to 68% by this point. Is this a good surprise or a bad surprise? This is just a surprise surprise. The good surprise is that uh, Alamance County experiences a lot of growth. I'm, I'm happy to see that. Um, the bad surprise is that it's not just that we've, we've had a good run. We've had kind of a normal run for us. Another way to illustrate that is to put the five cycles, to put 2009 back in, and just lay them out by year five, 2009 being the highest at 107. 85 the lowest at 68 and here we are right in the middle this is a normal cycle for us this is not really that i mean we've got a really strong market but we've had strong markets this happens one more question that i had when i saw this is what about the other 2017 revaluation counties 24 counties did reval in 2017 so how are they faring and do you see the highlights that say reval in year five those are the four-year cycles. The four-year cycles got to this, this point, but as of right now, they're back at 100% because they've already revalued. Now, the ones that haven't revalued, a lot of those have not seen a lot of growth. They didn't really have a spur to do that. Um, but if you look at some of the reval counties, you can see they get pretty low. New Hanover at, at 79%, Haywood at 76% last year. And so this is how most counties deal with it. When, when you get really strong growth, you shorten the reval cycle and catch it up. The ones with less growth aren't, aren't interested in that. I will say if you look at the median, you can see from last year to this year, from 2020 to 2021, the median jumps from 88 to 91. That's that reval hitting. We've gone from almost on the median to way away from it. So what does this mean? Why is this a concern other than just obviously there's a disparity in value? Well, General Statute 105-286-A2 
sets mandatory advancement anytime you drop below 85 percent. And what this means is that the Department of Revenue is going to give us three years to perform a revaluation. So there's no making it to 2025. They're going to push it forward to 2024. So already we're in a shortened cycle. We can't do eight years, we have to do seven years. That's not problematic for me because we can do it in two years and we have three. So I'm not concerned about that time frame. That works out uh, just fine. What I'm more concerned about are the public service companies. Now the public service companies, uh, these are airlines, bus lines, railroads, motor freight, electric companies, gas companies, solar energy, telecommunications. Um, sometimes we call this our corporate assessment or we call them public utilities. They're assessed by the Department of Revenue. My office does not assess them. We build them and collect them, but we don't do the assessments. They're all centrally assessed. <coughs> General Statute 105-284 sets adjustments to the public service companies based on this sales ratio study. So in the reval year, the fourth year from reval, which is this year, and the seventh year, if it drops below 90%, they adjust the value, they reduce the value on mm -hmm. those companies. Um, only for ones that own land, but most of them own land. Is they the Department, the Department of, of Revenue? Revenue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they use a weighted ratio. Uh, depending on what value is personal, what value is real property, they'll weight that in. And the idea is to make those companies look like Alamance County. So our personal is reassessed every year, so at 100%, and then our real is whatever the sales ratio percent is. They're, they're trying to equalize those back out. Um, and, and that's the, the reason behind it is that equalization. Every single year, Department of Revenue is assessing these, these businesses. They're always at 100%. And so if they're taxed at 100%, but we're basically discounting the real property in the county 20 25%, the tax burden is shifting onto these public utilities. And what the Department of Revenue is doing, they're shifting it back. Uh, um, the real problem here is personal property. Because personal property has nowhere to go. Real property is getting discounted because of that disparity. Public service is getting discounted because of this adjustment. Personal property is 100%. It's absorbing all of these shifts. So if someone owns vehicles, they don't own real property, they're absorbing. If you have a business, if that business has very little real, most of its values in its machinery and equipment, it's absorbing that hit. Um, so, you know, for that reason, there is a concern that we need to maintain equity and do a revaluation to bring this all back in line to stop this shifting of the tax burden. So what does this look like in dollars and cents? Now the percentage that they're going to use for adjustment is 84.59% if they own land. Some of them don't and they'll be at 100%. Now, I don't have access to the Department of Revenue's exact information. I've got just very rough information that they transmit to us with a billing file. So I don't know exactly where we're going to fall. I think 85% is a fair estimate to, to use for these calculations. Now, we anticipate for, for this year that our public service companies will be valued at $371 million. Well, if we keep 85% of that, we're down to 316. That's 55 million value loss. That's 373,000 revenue loss at our current tax rate. And I think we do have to consider our fire districts cumulatively are going to lose 31, 32,000. Our municipality is about 143 uh, collectively between all the municipalities. So really the countywide impact is closer to $550,000 per year. And this will grow over time. As these bases grow, it's going to exaggerate with each passing year until revaluation. So I'm going to do something that I rarely, if ever, do. I'm going to advocate for something here. Um, I don't think we need to wait for 2024 to do a revaluation. I think we need to do it for 2023. And the reason why, for one, if we wait until 2024, we're going to lose $1.2 million. And that's just general fund. I'm not including the municipalities or fire districts. If we stop it in 2023, we only lose 776. So we're 414 to be good to stop it a year early. Explain to this board. Absolutely. You and I have already talked about it. Mm -hmm. But explain to this board 
what you mean by we're going to lose. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is uh, in September when we get the billing file from the state, they will have docked it by this amount of revenue. And every year they'll continue to dock it. And so Meaning we lose money. We lose money. This is bottom line revenue. They take our money. Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. They do. How much? Is it 414 or is it less? 414 is the savings between those two years. But I'm so, talking about the state. You know, if the state comes in and starts taking your money, what, 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 what does it run? Is it run about 400000 In Well, for the first year that I'm estimating about 373, right. but because it's growing each year, yep. right, then by the last year it would be about 414 that year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be estimated at 15% of whatever the public services are valued at. It's what they're pulling. They're pulling that off the top. If they're collecting it but not sending it to us, is that what's going We're on? We're collecting it, but when they send us the billing file to bill out, they will have already reduced those bills, so we'll send smaller bills out and receive less money back. Okay. Yeah. So nobody's getting that money. Right. The, the, it's staying in the pocket of the public service company. Right. Yeah. Which is it's good for them, but it's part of this, this shifting around of the tax base. Uh, and the problem then is it puts pressure on the tax rate. Anytime it reduces those funds, it's got to come from somewhere. And, and that's, that's the challenge. So if we stop it early, then we'll save that last year of this reduction. We'll get put back to 100%. Now, what I do have to consider is that it will cost about 270000 additional dollars to do a revaluation. <coughs> Uh, over a course of two years, about a 60-40 front load. You have to pay? <laughs> you have to pay to do we everything. To do okay. God, I need to be the, I need to be a reval company. Okay, I'm sorry. It's just every time I turn around, we're paying. That is an amazing business, by the way. It is. Give us that number again, please. Uh, Give us the number again. And, and for the cost, the cost of reval. Uh, 270 additional, 270,000 additional dollars above what our, our base amount is. Now, the way that I think about it is this, and I'm notorious, I will drive a car into the ground because I just hate to, to buy that next car. If my car is running, it's just cheaper to keep driving it. Amen. And, and so this is the same philosophy, is there is a, a cost involved to waste a year. Well, we could have stretched it one more year, right? We don't have to do 2023, we could do 2024. So what are we giving up for that one year? Well, if I've got to spend an additional 270 and the whole cycle has been trimmed down to seven years, I'm going to say each year is worth 38500 So I need to deduct that from the 414. We're still netting 375 to the good if we go ahead and do 2023 rather than waiting for 2024. So from a financial point of view, I, I think that that's the better decision. There are two other factors I think that come into play, and one is equity. We're talking about the shifting of the tax base. This corrects it. This brings us back to everyone being reset to 100%. Obviously, it immediately begins to drift, but this will at least bring us back close again. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned about is this reminds me so much of what happened in 2008 and 2009. Now, I've been involved in real estate one way, shape, or form since 1998. And I remember back in 2002 having so many conversations about the market and, hmm, there is a bubble forming. This is going to catch up sooner or later. Uh, I remember back in 2006, uh, 2007 with this department looking at sales and not understanding how this is working. This is going to come down at some point. Well, it comes down during rebound. And I remember 2009. Uh, there were not literal torches and pitchforks, but figuratively, <laughs> that's exactly what we saw. Uh, the citizens do not appreciate that when their values are crashing, ours are soaring. And if we go into a revaluation and we don't advance it, if it's 2024, if it bursts and that happens again, we have nowhere to move. We just repeat 2009. But if we've advanced it to 2023, and let's say the worst happens and it bottoms out just as we're trying to do a reval, we have the option of pushing it back to 2024, resetting those values and fixing the problem, and not raising everyone's taxes at the same time that the market is collapsing. Now, I hope it doesn't. I hope it just keeps on going, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. But having gone through that once, I like the ability to maneuver. 
The board wouldn't have to. If, if you wanted to stick with it even on the way down, you could stick with it. But you have the option all of a sudden if you wanted to step back a year and recalculate. So a 2020 not only cost and the equity would give us that maneuverability in case the market comes down. So I, I think that that's the, the best option for us. Um, let's see. So neither the mandatory advancement that the state's going to force to 2024 or the optional advancement that I'm recommending to 2023 uh, would change us from an eight-year county. We're still on an eight-year cycle. That's a one-time disruption in that cycle, but by default, we stay eight years. That being said, I think it's worth considering a four-year cycle because, as I've noted, historically for our county, this is not unusual this can happen again and this can happen again. It's happened before, but at the time, the way we were structured, revaluations were so much more expensive, it didn't make sense financially. Now it does. And so I, I think that's a better option, as you can see with many of our peers that have adopted that. Um, so something to consider. Well, that's kind of a function, too, of the fact that we're 10th, I believe, 10th fastest growing county in the state. Oh, absolutely. So absolutely. that kind of a growth rate is gonna accelerate property values until we can get built to a point. I mean, in Burlington, I looked the other day, I think there were 67 houses on the market in the entire city. And I had a realtor tell me there weren't but 55 the day he checked. And Bill, I think you were looking at something like that too. So, I mean, we, and that's just Burlington, but Alamance County is experiencing the same thing. I, Absolutely. I don't know why, but I enjoy playing on Zillow and it just, uh, <laughs> it's driving me nuts. I look at that thing you and I say, like, wow. <laughs> properties are just rolling up I looked at a house in our neighborhood the other day and I could not believe what it was valued at mm -hmm. and that's and it's changed it, it's cycled higher and already is under market and it was only on the market like four or five days mm -hmm. I mean people are bidding for houses here they're buying them mm -hmm. they're looking at them online buying them before they even get into town to take a look at the house when you was talking about the two hundred thousand dollar house, you sell it for two hundred sixty thousand. Aren't you going to hurt a lot of people's feelings if you start raising whatever it is you're talking about? Billy's over here like he knows all this stuff, and I'm over here hearing you're going to raise something, and that's not going to be nice because they're not going to like it. Well, it's got to go. They. Up. It's got to go up at some point, and and this is one of the differences. The the sooner you do it, the smaller the increase. When you wait eight years to reset, yeah, it's I get a that. huge pickup. If okay. you do it in four years, it's a much smaller adjustment. But we need to be in parity with the market, and, and that's where we've, we've come out of step. <clears throat> so 2022 is too soon. I, it's possible, but it would uh, be exorbitantly expensive to do. You, it's already to, 270000 Is it going to be er more if you go earlier? It used to be $1.6 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. And just for reference, too, I can't remember the term. I was sitting here thinking about it. But what's the term, Brian, that uh, when we do the budget based on that revaluation, we don't. It, it's not that the 67 cents rides the new market value. It's that we. Revenue neutral. What did you say, Jerry? Revenue neutral. Revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. Make a revenue neutral adjustment. So the tax rate, the tax rate has down. to come down yeah, the property as the property ta up. value. But that's up. really good, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that it should keep our it should keep our residents on parity with where they were yeah. when they went into the reval. And you can do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I can't do that, but this board will do that. <laughs> We can ask you to do that for two hundred seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> Sold to the man in the gray jacket. Right. Jeez, God, never seen and, and so many to, to the person's bottom line, this is not a disruption. Okay. The the value goes up, the rate goes down. It will re rebalance. So if you're in a, a, a area where growth has has happened faster, you may pick up a little bit. If you're in an area with less growth or even decline, you may go down a little bit. But the bottom line is not going to be the kind of swing we're talking about on the value side of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so I know I've got one more. Oh. Uh, if the board wants to change that, it's as simple as a resolution. We can send the resolution off to the DOR and the cycle's changed. Very easy to do. 
uh, it can be moved back later for changes to mind. It, it doesn't lock you in uh, to, to do that. You can always say, mm, push it back if we need to. But the reval cost will stay the same every four years as opposed to every eight years, right? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Do you have to go to everybody's house and reevaluate their Everybody. house? Everybody. Yeah. How many bedrooms you got now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure Tony's got some extra people. <laughs> Jeez. And, and I'm not asking for uh, any kind of decision. This is an information item for the board. Now, if you're just motivated and you want to do something, I'm, I'm here. But uh, I realize that this is a, a very large scope. Revaluation is a very large scope. And just kind of bring this up to, to begin the discussion. Uh, if you have any, any questions, you want any information from me as we go, but I did want to, to broach that that's something we need to consider. Um, and we talked about this last year. Um, I think our, if I remember correctly, our propensity for the board was to really seriously consider going to a four-year revaluation. There's so many reasons to do that. Mm -hmm. um, eight years stretches it out so far. Mm -hmm. and. It can negatively impact some people. So, uh. just have one question. You mentioned it before. I just want to clear it up. Sure. You said that we can go through this process, mm -hmm. and then when we're ready, the process is done, and we're ready to implement it. Mm -hmm. If the market conditions aren't in our favor, like you were saying in 08 and 09, we could back off right. and hold off mm -hmm. and make that and for one more that. year. For one more year, just. Right. Okay. But that being said, mm -hmm. if that happens. Mm -hmm. Are we able to still do the four year? Mm -hmm. We can. Yeah, it, it wouldn't affect that um, okay. basically. And, and this is one of the advantages to counties that are on force is if they hit this sort of a, a pothole as they're driving, they can always just say five. Because it doesn't take long, but you can push it back as long as you don't push it beyond eight. That's that's where the limit is. And so having a shorter cycle lets you maneuver. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened uh, in 2009, is counties that had shorter cycles were able to push back from it. And we could do that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds good. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Well, very, thank you very so much. Very informative and extremely interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments by the board? Are there any motions? Let's move to the next item. Okay. Okay. Come to the big one. Richard Hill. Oh, yeah. Thanks, sir. I was looking for you over here. <laughs> I knew you were So I think I've been introduced to everybody except Mr. Lashley. So welcome to Thank the you. board and Thank look you, forward sir. to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. I do appreciate it. Number two, um, we'll be talking about contracts with Mesco Engineering out of Garner. Well, as you know, Mr. Wayne Sullivan, the principal engineer, is here. So he can answer any questions you may have or elaborate on anything that I say. Uh, number three, engineers can't talk without a drawing. So we're <laughs> going to limit this to one drawing. If we can regress just for a minute about the uh, roadside, we spend a lot of time dealing with that because it comes our way. Um, before we get started into a broader conversation, um, your problem is residential, not commercial. So build that into your thought process. That's where the trash comes from, roadside litter. Uh, and number two, um, Bruce and I were talking about this just yesterday. I floated an idea to a couple of the municipalities this last year about tacking on a $1 tipping fee. It's about $125,000. That would be used exclusively for contracting roadside litter cleanup. Don't know if that's of any interest. Have not had that conversation with Brian, so that's a complete surprise to him. But it is one way of evenly distributing some of that Responsibility. That would so be a one dollar tipping fee. Is one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. We could dedicate that straight to contracting with groups to go clean up the side of the road in combination to whatever the sheriff and the DOT is doing on the interstates, um, whatever we're doing with the private companies. Um, it's just something to consider, but it's evenly distributed, kind of to <coughs> everybody who's using the landfill. What's a typical tipping fee at this point? We're at $40 a ton, two of which goes to the state. Regionally, the average is about 45 And then nationally, it's all over the place. California versus New York versus Florida can be dramatically different. 
So that forty goes to the state. That's adding a dollar would we'd keep the dollar we'd add, right? We charge forty. Two goes to the state. Thirty-eight is our revenue. Um, it's what we use to pay the bills. And if we did that one, we could dedicate it. I guess Clyde would let us know how, but we would dedicate that to just hiring somebody to clean the roadsides up. It's just an idea. A hundred and what did you say it would create? About a hundred and twenty-five. We do one hundred twenty-five thousand tons a year. It's a one dollar ton. One hundred twenty-five. Now, my understanding is that the landfill makes a profit. Um, we used to. <laughs> no, we we do. We're going to spend a lot of it in the next couple of years, and that's we'll be talking a lot about that. We run about uh, a five and a quarter million dollar budget, a little bit more than that. We typically try to come in about a million and a half dollars profit. Um, long conversations with Andrea and others about how we go forward with uh, keeping those ratios up. We've got a lot of expense coming, and we'll talk about that. But um, we are an enterprise fund. We take no tax revenue, so we support ourselves. Okay, so what we were here to talk about was a contract with MESCO. So uh, a couple years ago, we recognized that we're giving out a space at the existing sale. Mm -hmm. If you look at the map, current MSW135, that's where we've been since 1993. Huge sale. Uh, Miss Thompson was out the other day. She could attest. <laughs> the area where we're working right now is the little voided area at the bottom. We've got about three years left, and you'll see a ledger at the top that's color coded that gives you the approximate years at today's volume and compaction. So it's just an estimate to tell you we've got 60 years of life out there going forward and about how it'll break down. So knowing that we've only got three more years, we got to build what is referred to here as number six cell. Now that requires an enormous amount of prerequisite work. Lots of engineering, wells going in, we're working with the uh, Corps of Engineers on wetlands. So the money we're asking for, this $310,000, was an estimate that Wayne and his group put together about a year ago. What's it going to cost us to do the architecture, if you will, if you're building a building? Now, in addition to those costs, we had to spend about $75,000 to put wells in. We have completed that work a couple of weeks ago. I think the bill came in just shy of $70,000. We're also going to have to spend about $35,000 with the Corps of Engineers, $3,500 for a permit, and then the fund we have to pay into. We have a little wet area that me and you would call a pond or a mud puddle. They call it a wetlands and we pay them $50,000 or whatever. So what we're asking for in this contract is to pay not to exceed to MESCO $310,000 to do the full array of prerequisite work up to and including design plans to be bid for the construction of the next sale. We believe that next sale is going to be around 30 acres, 16 to be constructed, 14 in the future. That 16 acres will cost us somewhere around $7 million to construct. We anticipate taking all of that money out of air unrestricted funds. That's money we've made over the years. Now we got 12 million, we're getting ready to spend seven, eight of it right there. So you can see that funding going down. But principally, that's what we're after here. Is your okay $310,000 contract for all the engineering that needs to be done? And these funds are in the landfill's budget? Currently. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Yes, this was budgeted in the budget. Yeah. Put in the budget this year. Any questions, comments? We talked about this last year too. So. Yeah. It's not, we're going to be talking a lot the next year or two. Just yep. a lot of things happening. And just, just a reminder: I have requested a field trip for <coughs> us to the landfill. Thomas, you can go with us, <laughs> so we can all five go at the same time. <laughs> Where I go, you go. And um, I just think it needs to be really seen. This is this place is a rock star for the county boy the importance of a landfill for a county with bringing stuff here so I just think I'm like the assistant director down there it's just <laughs> unbelievable it's amazing quick question what's the status of uh, recycling right now 
I know we've been, yeah, been up and down on that. Emily's here, and she's our recycle expert, Emily Ball Assistant Director. You want to you wanna answer that? Sure, I can. She thinks I'm way too negative, so I'll let her be positive. <laughs> I knew she was here, so I wanted to make sure she got an opportunity, oh, right? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, um, actually, with um, COVID, recycling has um, increased um, because everybody's been at home. Um, the March, April, and May last year were the three busiest months we've ever had at the landfill in our history. All the packaging uh, from Amazon, right? <laughs> the cardboard has been <laughs> extremely um, plentiful. Um, but the problem with um, the increase in recycling is the increase in contamination mm -hmm. um, because we have wishful recyclers out there who want to recycle anything that has a recycle symbol on it, and that's not the case in our industry. So, um, so the contamination has gone up along with the volume. So we're still working on how to, how to get that down. And the state actually uh, as a whole has a team in Raleigh that um, has helped counties um, tackle that, that exact problem. So we're working with them. What about so, the sale of recycled materials like to, to be processed? Um, the market is going back up. Um, it did go down. Um, well, of course it went down with when China stopped accepting right. more recycling, but it did um, start to go back up, but then it went down again during COVID. Um, so it's starting to rebound again. I sold a couple um, loads this past um, month that were higher than they had been last month. Vietnam or? So, no, well, I, I sell to mills here in, in the U.S. Okay. So, um, so it was higher than um, it was last summer. So prices are going back up. So I know we used to make some money on that, but uh, we break even. The home run is metals. Metals yeah. is great right now, yeah. uh, but we lose a lot on plastics, mm -hmm. newsprint, mm -hmm. aluminum can. Well, aluminum probably does okay. Yeah, aluminum the and cardboard are, are the are the biggest money makers. And I was shocked to find out last year. I think it was last year or year before last. I found out that you can't recycle shredded paper. Correct. That just didn't make any sense to me. We've it already done up, part of the work. It messes up the machinery in the recycle companies. It yeah. works. We need to yeah. get that message out because I know a lot of people shred and then throw it in the recyclable mm -hmm. bin in a plastic bag or something. Right. You can't do that. So. Yeah. Plastic grocery bags is something else we should not put in That's the right. Bin. Grocery bags, your newspaper <laughs> wrapper. Right, right. I don't have a wrapper on yours, but there's <laughs> somebody who shall remain unmentioned has a wrapper on theirs. So. <laughs> so, yeah. So, it's looking better. Back to some of the things Jeremy was talking about, though, in growth, we're seeing it. You know, a year ago, Emily, we were at 350 tons um, a day. Okay. We're at 450 tons a day. Yes. And it's not unusual on some days to do in excess of 600 tons. Wow. Sure. So the city of Mebane is driving it. West Burlington, West Burlington some, but Mebane is just running us uh, crazy. And uh, we, so far we've been able, you ask about manning, we've been able to absorb this with our own manning. It's getting more and more difficult. More and more difficult. Well, what do you need from us tonight? I need, you to, you're okay on a contract for $310,000. Um, so we can pay the bills to get ready for construction next year of sale number six. Motion to approve. Second. Any other comments? Oh, I'm favoring it by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. You can go ahead to item two if you'd like. I'm next. <laughs> so, um, back in our conversation about the little white area on MSW 1 through 5, um, that area was a five acre area that had been used as a rain pond. It had a rain cover over three geosynthetic fiber of fabrics that are underneath it to not allow leachate or water to run through. As we were progressing in that area, we began last June. In February, as we pulled part of the rain cover back, we found a problem. The geo um, fabrics underneath that rain cover, two of the three had slid. They're not supposed to slide. And we believe that was a factor due to that rain cover is in place for 15 years. It's sitting there baking in the summer sun. There's gaseous situations that come up from the clay. It impregnates and did a did a did things happen. So we are in a big, long conversation with the Department of Environmental Quality right now about the repair of that liner. 
and um, we've been at it for two months. I know Wayne today was just writing a response for what we believe to be the final stages of soil testing for metals to make sure there's no contamination, um, but also <coughs> some quality control analysis of the original seat geosynthetics that were there to make sure that they're still intact in other places where we already have trash and then to make the repair to the torn liner. Now that was something completely unexpected had no idea that was there until February. We've estimated the cost of repair at $250,000. Now that was not budgeted in any way. So what compromises that number is we're asking for $125,000 tonight, again for a contract from MESCO to do all the engineering required as a prerequisite to that repair. Then, upon approval from DEQ, the repair will be bid and we'll make that repair. And we believe that is about a one month project. So this is a hiccup in the scheme of things, but it's something that we got to get behind us. Met with finance about funding, um, talked about whether we should pull money out of savings or take it from other line items. So we're so far into the year, we really can't pull it other, out of other line items. But we're about $600,000 positive on revenue from that other conversation we just had. We're just getting bombarded with trash. So we have the money in our working budget to pay for all of this without having to take anything out of savings. We would budget the, uh, some of the additional revenue that has been coming in above their projected revenues and operating costs to pay for this um, $250,000 project. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. I also would like to add to that uh, authorize the county manager to sign the contract. Um, Mr. Hager, that's something you and I talked about on this one contract. Uh, yes, sir. This this item would require the budget amendment, uh, mm -hmm. budgeting the additional revenues, and then authorizing the manager to sign the contract due to the dollar amount of the contract. Right. Is that your motion? Yes. And second. Goes along with that. Are these uh, liners under any kind of warranty? Uh, Wayne, you want to go there? Warranty of the liner? There is a warranty, but not against what failed. The liner themselves have a, a certain warranty. If they fail to fail, the fact that it all failed, fell down without anything to do with the individual items. To further complicate, I know it was long here, we don't want to drag this on, but the same people we are going to to give us the okay on the next sale are the very people we are working with on the repair of the liner. So we have to be extremely careful. Um, they're being hard to deal with, but we'll, we'll get through that. Um, but we don't seem to have an avenue on any kind of guarantee. And it was a bad design, to be quite honest with you, 15 years ago. It was a bad design, signed by the state. And, 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 and let me we, say, Commissioners, the <laughs> landfill staff, from the state. upon <laughs> discovering this, made it known to the state, made it known to my office. Uh, this has been, uh, we've been working with the state of North Carolina and MESCO um, from its immediate discovery until now. So uh, it's been very open, and uh, communications are all included in your packet, too, so everyone can see what's been happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Look forward to seeing you at the landfill. No, we haven't had a vote yet. We got a vote. But I think you're good. Okay. <laughs> do we want to vote? Yeah, let's okay, do that. Let's vote. Right, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Thank you. All in for favor, what you signify do. by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Okay. Health director again. Thank you. Okay, Commissioners, before you is a um, budget and amendment request in the amount of $37,549 from a grant that came from the State Division of Public Health, Environmental Health Section, Food and Protection, to our Environmental Health, uh, Food and Lodging uh, Section. Uh, there is no local match uh, for this grant award. And uh, in your packet, it says one vehicle, but what I'd like to do is buy two used vehicles to replace uh, two cars that are more than 21 uh, years of age, um, so they're, they're, they're quite out there. And our food and lodging does do a lot of 
uh, driving, so they put mileage on, on those vehicles. Is there any chance of using anything that's coming off line from the sheriff's office in that venue, or the sheriff's still sitting behind you there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> any chance of using it? Is there anything coming off line with the sheriff's department that might be of value to, to the health department there, sheriff? Um. Coming off the line, what are you talking about? Any vehicles? Uh, he, he's talking about purchasing oh. two used vehicles instead of one new one. I didn't know if there might be any benefit to them from anything coming out of I know you're looking at do donating a couple to um, ACC. I didn't know if there might be anything of value there. I think 10 to ACC. Uh, there will be some coming off the line uh, probably in the next month and a half, two months. Just an idea. But all those vehicles have to get ACC and then really revamped, do they not? They do. And you don't have the ability to do that, to revamp vehicles before usage. Correct. <laughs> well, if he's buying them, he could buy them from ACC then, I guess that would be a possibility sure. too. Yeah. Just an idea. Just so they work. So they work. Yeah. That's yeah. important. We don't want anybody yeah, in the car that doesn't work. Inspections, right. uh, in a safe manner, yeah. You know, we uh, we asked AC, uh, ACC to, to fix up one for those 10. We could possibly uh, ask them again to fix up one. Uh, they're good at, at, at average speeds, but, you know, our officers in pursuit, they're dangerous, but ACC goes in and fixes them up, and we use them in driver's training, chase situations and stuff in training. <coughs> Don't mind helping him if he needs one, but you know, that's yeah, there's no match from the county for these folks, right? Correct, there's no match. Motion to approve, second, second. Mm -hmm. motion and second. Any uh, further discussion to be mm -hmm. none? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. all opposed. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Okay, Scott, I think you're the soul. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll make this brief. This is a uh, request to adjust the money awarded through the Elder Justice Grant through the Office of Violence Against Women. We were one of 10 recipients in the country for this grant 2016-2019 cycle, and then we were awarded um, a continuation grant. So the board has already approved the entirety of the grant. We need to move $63,474.66 from last year's budget to this year's budget. And just pre-warning y'all, because of COVID, we will be asking for an extension for this grant. So I'll probably come back in front of you again in September and ask for you to adjust it one more time. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. Need further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Thank no. You. Thank you. <laughs> We'd also point out on that there's no county match on that either. Okay. Okay. Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Brian was sitting there ribbing me a little bit about being last. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff asked me early tonight, where am I on the agenda? I said, you're early. You're early on. We're, getting, we're ordering in breakfast when we finish here. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm appearing before you tonight, uh, commissioners, to ask uh, two different grants. One is State Criminal Alien Assistance Grant. We keep aliens, and uh, the state will pay us for doing it through a grant where asking permission to receive $50,000 and that can be used for updates anything in that jail and right now Spectrum has uh, it and sometime in June will discontinue the TV in the jail which was free to us for the past few years and we're going to have to pay $600 a month for that to be continued if we don't you can bet they'll be tearing uh, uh, the jail all to pieces so hmm. uh, so get cable huh Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't care what you get. You don't get to leave. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm for it. You know, that can be used in several ways. One, if they're able to see it. 
uh, they are calm. And if you have someone that uh, really don't want to behave, and you take the privilege of that TV, they take you know they mm -hmm. they'll frown on them, mate, to cause the problems and help keep it straight there at the jail. Thank you, sir. And I ask it we be able to uh, move forward on that particular grant. No match on that, correct? No, sir. Absolutely not. I'll make a motion. Second. Motion second. Any further comments? Being none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. No. Thank right. you. Thank you. The second one is a pro uh, project safe neighborhood grants. Uh, I know uh, some time ago I come before the commissioners uh, as a result of uh, Matthew Martin, uh, U.S. Attorney, wanting us to develop a strike force. You were um, so gracious to uh, give me four people to do that. And now they have some money. We are requesting a dog uh, and the upfit for the vehicle for the dog. Uh, and uh, uh, they're willing to give us, we're asking them to be able to accept $26,997. Again, no county match. Do I now? No, no county, county match, match there. No. I'll make a motion. Second. Yeah, motion second. No further comments. <clears throat> I stand. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you, you Commissioner. Thank you, Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you, <Terry. laughs> Okay. Uh, any further public speakers? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. None. Excellent. Call it twice to see if it's working. It's working. <laughs> Mr. Hager, any follow? The only thing I would bring to the commissioner's attention, you have a report in your packet, uh, our, our physical report, sales tax revenues continue to be um, very, very high. Uh, we're 30.8% higher this month uh, Jan uh, for January of 21 than we were for January 20. That's, that's significantly higher for the fiscal year. Uh, sales tax revenue is 14.9% higher than actuals from last fiscal year, extremely high. You remember we uh, COVID uh, had us predicting a 20% decrease. I will be talking with the commissioners on May 3rd about the possibility of bringing back some uh, capital expenditures with some of the sales tax revenue that might help us in next year's budget. So uh, just be on the lookout for that. But other than that, that's all I have. Uh, Thank you. Any other commissioner? Um, I just have remarks? two things. I just need to ask Clyde. Um, I had stopped by and asked you about some policy things concerning what exactly a regular scheduled event was. I come to your office and talk to you about it. Um, I, I would like to know maybe even a better definition because um, you had sent me a website of, of a certain thing I was asking about that said they're designated nights but if if a company is going by that policy and they are doing other nights as well does that violate that policy if that is on their website well we're, you're talking about the uh, racetrack right um, it's it's dangerous to regulate a business using the police power for noise ordinance yeah and i'm sorry race, but i can't hear what you're saying a, ra <coughs> a racetrack by its very nature is very noisy oh yeah and that noise ordinance that the county has adopted really applies to ab abnormal noises, abnormally loud, loud noises. If your neighbor wants to start working on racing engines in a residential neighborhood and revving them up and tuning them up, that's what that's really applied for. But the racetrack was specifically exempted okay. from um, the noise ordinance. And the issue is what is a regularly scheduled event and that's up to them. They, as I said in a memo to you, that they reduce their races to every other Friday. All right. So seven months out of the year is, is their season. That's yeah. where they make all their money. And I want them to because yeah. that's hard work and they took a big hit with COVID as well. I just hope that um, the racetrack was there first and, and people have moved there and there are churches close by and I just hope that um, all of them can come to some kind of um, balance so that everybody's positive because I, I know the folks that own that racetrack they're good people 
and I want them to succeed. But I also think about the neighbors, you know, because right. it is it is <laughs> difficult. It's like I think I'm going to buy a house on the end of a runway at Aeroplane. <laughs> no, I don't think well, I'm going to expect yeah, it to be, you, unless we get electric race cars. You certainly couldn't expect the airport to shut down if no, you bought a house. No, and I wouldn't. At the end of the runway. And I've got <laughs> one more thing that Bruce is going to help me with. Um, this has to do with, I had another something I was going to talk about, but it's too late. This, this little dude right here lives out at Cedar Rock Park, and his name, I had a lady to call me last week that was so concerned about the cows because the cows are leaving, and who knew the cows were not part of the historical Cedar Rock Park when it was in history or whatever. And she was real concerned. We had some other people to ask us about taking the cows out and uh, we want to make sure that was okay. Um, Cause working with some really heavy stuff, therapeutic animals are the absolute best for someone. They just, you can tell an animal anything you want to and they'll just love you back for it and not tell your secrets. But I had a lady to contact me about some um, difficult times she had had and she was going to Cedar Rock Park walking just enjoying such a beautiful scenery and she met him his name to her is Clyde <laughs> and I'm telling you don't even don't you must even be extremely intelligent. No, listen to me listen to me this, this guy's been a real a horse, um a it's a mule that up, right? I'm that not is, making this is, up uh, you men need to chill <laughs> you need to just chill here this is serious um, but he is out there, and his his uh, pasture mate passed away. So Brian uh, Baker has promised me they have bought a new mule for him to have some company. But the thing of it is, is this guy has really made a big difference to her, like so many other people that may go out there and go fishing, that may go walking, that may go riding, that may go do anything. But what I'm saying is this is really important. This has really been a lifesaver for her, and I appreciate that. And um, I just want us to always realize how lucky we are to have our parks here. We need to take care of them. And we need to realize that Cedar Rock Park is busy enough and it's a tranquility place. And Clyde likes graham crackers. So I heard <laughs> him, at, don't motion me, Thomas, I'm gonna hurt you. So anyway, um, I just want us to realize that every little small thing in this county is big to somebody. And we need to honor and respect that. So. I encourage you all to go out there and meet him. He's amazing. So that's all I, I got. One thing, I also talked to the same lady, and she confirmed that his name was Clark. Yeah. That's a great name. I mean, it's Scottish for heard from afar. And I bet when he braves, you can hear him. Yes. Oh, it's true. Do I, have a motion? Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. A couple of comments, please. Okay. Um, I didn't know Pam had brought this up, but uh, I'd been working with uh, Dan Danley out of the airport for a couple of a couple of months, really, just trying to find a time when he could we could get together and look at what was going on out there. Our airport is pretty phenomenal, mm -hmm. um, so we finally got arrangements made to, to visit out there, and he shared some information with me, which I understand he's going to be bringing to us during the budget process some of this information. But I just thought it was interesting. Our, I haven't actually sorted this by dollars, but just looking at the numbers, I know we're near the top. Uh, Burlington Alamance Regional Airport is, produces an, has an economic output to the county of $172 million. Mm -hmm. That's not chump change, guys. And they have so much stuff going on out there. I would, I would really encourage all of you to try and arrange a time to get with uh, Dan at the airport and just let him take you on a tour. Um, it's well worth it. Uh, take the opportunity to meet the business people that are working out there. We have a number of, we have a, an organization that uh, repairs and maintains air ambulances that are used in a mission program in Honduras and uh, Guatemala. We have uh, LabCorp running jets out there almost 24 hours a day, or all night anyway. I, I can't remember exactly how long during the day, but I mean, they're getting ready to, and you talk about some assets, they just bought a $10 million jet. Now, yeah. run the numbers on that and look at what that means in county revenue from a, a property tax perspective, and that doesn't depreciate in five years. Um, and they're looking at other jets, other planes. There, there's a need, there's, a, there's demand. I have a good friend who's already trying to find a hangar. 
for his personal plane and uh, there's demand for more hangars out there there's demand for that area to grow and it's a big asset to the county so I, I would encourage you guys to take a look at that I asked Clyde to take a look at something today that we got an email about <laughs> I've never heard of this I know some of y'all may be aware it's out there we've got an area we've got a creek in the county called Stinky, Stinky Creek and uh, well, we have one of Burlington some, now. And there's a road that runs across it or near it or something called Stinky Creek Road. Stinky and we Quarter have some Creek. constituents yeah. who are concerned that their people are making a joke of where they live because they live on Stinky Creek Road. So Clyde has told me that there is a process we can use to actually change the name of that creek and the, the name of the road if we want to. So we he's, uh, he's sent us an email through a petition today. with the state and the U.S. Geological Survey and they actually have a petition to remove offensive names from uh, geological sites. So we just have to file a petition and we can take the stinky sign down and it'll just be Quarter Creek. Well, in my last comment, um, we've been criticized because at our last meeting we made a decision not to take all the premium. And part of the reason we did that, I think all of us looked at it and realized we have a pile of money, a lake full of money, flowing into Alamance County. We, as, as has been demonstrated here tonight, we don't know how it all can or has to be spent. It's apparent that some of the money coming to ABSS can be spent on HVAC because there are requirements for upgrading the heating and air systems to include air filtration. Um, I had a conversation with, uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Vines, who's hanging in here tonight, talking about the fact that he's seen some possible requirements coming from, I guess, EPA, Henry, that may mandate some of the similar requirements, may mandate changes to heating and air systems in businesses. So we've got a lot of money coming in here, and we don't know how it all has to be spent. Our job is to manage the finances for the county, and it's not incumbent upon us to borrow money when we may have money that can be spent to do some of the processes that are needed. We, the fortunate, good, the good news in this is we still have approximately, I guess, 18 to 20 million dollars in bonds. We'll know tomorrow that can be issued if we need to issue them for these purposes, and we may still get have the ability to get a premium but it's prudent and I think it was a prudent on the part of this board to make a decision to wait until we can figure out exactly what we need to do and exactly how we have to spend money to get everything done with as few dollars out of our taxpayers as possible so and I just want to we applaud us absolutely for what I think was a good decision and uh, thank you and I'd like to say there's one particular school board member that uh, really <clears throat> did trash us. So uh, I agree with Mr. Carter's comments. Well, um, I think that the school board member that you're speaking of maybe didn't read the fine print. We actually gave the school system, she does, probably doesn't realize this, we gave the school system an option that they didn't have when they started this process. Mm -hmm. We gave them $150 million that they asked for, and by the grace of the market, if the market wasn't this way, we wouldn't be able to do this. Now the school, if the, something should go wrong, they got access, they can go back to the bond market That's right. and get $20 million more. Yeah. So if they didn't dot their I's and cross their T's or something happens, we gave them some options. We actually gave them some options that they didn't give us. And I'm actually uh, happy of the way we did this bond because I'm in the options market and I love options. Everybody yeah. should have options. That's what makes America great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. That's all I had to say. Any other comments? May I have a motion to adjourn? Still <laughs> so moved. Second. <laughs> Yeah, motion second. All in favor, signify by saying I am uh, leaving. <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. 
Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.